I'm hoping today that I'll be able to uh, share something of value, but there is a bit of a challenge for me at the outset, which is that there's a reasonable prospect that someone sitting in the room is going to go, oh yeah, we've done that. And it'll be completely underwhelming because, as you will all know, you don't know about the work you're doing in your own area and its relative value and, and its potential generalizability. It's literally impossible until you share it. And um, I think I'm, we're only really at the point now where it's capable of sharing at all. So I haven't done very many of these. So um, I hope there's some cool stuff today. But if, you, if you're wholly underwhelmed, I apologize in advance. What can I say? Uh, I'm kind of committed. I can't rewrite any other software at this stage. So uh, you're going to get what you're going to get. So the structure of the uh, session, I'm going to do a relatively short first session, I'd like to say in the spirit of adult learning and we can only concentrate for 45 minutes, but it's not like that, it's just the way the slide deck worked. Um, so I'm going to do quite a short thing which is going to be about conceptual background, which is very important to me because I'm very, very interested in this generalizability. And I'm going to end up with an E equals, like Einstein style, except mine's a bit crap, especially compared to Einstein's, which is very, very good indeed. Um, I'm sure he'll be very honoured at my... Uh, my gratitude. Um, uh, but, but there is something very important about how we think about data just at this point in history, I think, because there's uh, some interesting arguments that I'll go through. And, and, and also about how it's applied and how we think about leadership in the context of data, which I think is also very important. Anyway, the, the more insignificant bit of the session that I'm interested in, uh, the spirit of sharing, is showing you the stuff we've done. So the more important bit actually is after coffee. So I'm going to try and get us to coffee relatively quickly. And then, if you could come back after that, I'd give it at least 20 minutes before you kind of go to the toilet and leave if you think it's a bit rubbish. <laughs> Just giving you, you know, the subtext. I know, you know, we know. Um, the inbox never goes away. So, um, yeah. Oh, the other thing is health and safety. Does anybody mind if we turn the fluorescent lights out? I'm a little bit photosensitive to the high frequency. I had meningitis when I was younger, and I think it's never quite left me. Um, certainly not the fear of lumbar punctures has never left me. Um, only some of you will fully appreciate that comment if you've ever had a six junior doctors in succession attempt to get fluid out of your spine and they all failed. But I'm not bitter. <laughs> and it turned out to be viral, so it was all completely futile. Um, but we didn't know that at the time. Um, okay, good. Uh, where to start, big topic. Uh, so. I want to make two or three uh, preliminary uh, observations. The first is, uh, I'm, so, so a little bit about me. For those of you here yesterday, I apologize. I've only got one joke about myself, um, apart from my life, which is the uh, existential issue. Um, in, my, uh, in, in my 20s, I studied philosophy. So I studied stoicism and ambiguity in the philosophy of language. I got my PhD from Durham. And, um, and then I went on to a career in largely the political management of healthcare. So I'm about 18 years in um, and, and, and after my last job, which was as an advisor to the Republic of Ireland during the financial crisis, which was very, very intense, uh, I then moved to the Gold Coast about three and a half years ago, nearly four years ago now, uh, personally on a kind of mission to go back into operations, which I think is where the answer is, somewhere there. Um, and I, I got very frustrated with national policy on the basis that it's, in the end for me, it was a little bit like, uh, have we got people from the Ministry of Health here? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I've done that, and it's really hard, um, and, and nobody's, great, nobody's grateful at all, ever. Um, again, not bitter. Um, but, but in the end, when I was thinking about national policy, I almost thought of it like a data set, because it, it, you're, you're publishing things which, uh, which apply to everybody equally. And, and at the start, you think, well, that might be kind of a, a route to a just world, because everyone's got consistency and sameness. But at the end, I ended up thinking of it as like the mean value in a data set of many, many different points, all the different points being clinical teams and organizations and natural histories. And the interesting thing about averages in big data sets typically isn't that they hit uh, the right level of values, it's that they hit no values at all. So the average number might be completely different to every other number in the set, and that became a metaphor for policy for me because I thought, what if the stuff we're publishing actually isn't relevant to anybody ever? And that worried me, and still does. Um, I'm going to move on. The point about that story is that, is that when, as in, in my work now, the only thing I think is interesting and valuable is at clinical team level. So I think we've got big issues about multidisciplinary teams, big issues about relationships and culture and hierarchies. But actually the work of the work, in that deeming sense, the execution of the mission of the business is done in those sacred spaces in clinics and in um, 
surgeries and in the cubicles and the labs that make up our modern healthcare systems. But the people who do that work do it almost exclusively in teams. And my question when I got to the Gold Coast or my journey back into operations was to begin asking people what information do you have on a daily basis that tells you about the aggregate impacts of the work of you and your colleagues? And I expected the answer to be not very much, but it wasn't. The answer was nothing at all. And, uh, and this was a very interesting uh, revelation. It's not that there's no information out there. I don't think there's just, a, I don't think there's been information system specifically designed to target the lived experience of clinical teams. And yet we have a vast superstructure, a huge expense that we generate for accountability reasons, but actually we can't get it into the business in ways that are meaningful. And so that, that, that stuff about the meaningfulness of information as it relates to people in their lived lives, trying to solve what for all the world looked like wicked problems, was a very striking uh, moment. Anyway, and hence, hence some of the stuff. And then from a system leadership point of view, in healthcare, I think we, we, we have to try and diagnose problems that emerge, either quality and safety or access or, or, or effectiveness. I'll talk predominantly about access today, that's where I focus most of my work. Uh, between, between problems of behaviour or problems of resource or problems of process. And the reason why this is particularly important is that if we get that diagnosis wrong, we do the wrong intervention and we make the problem worse. So for example, if we have a, a problem of behaviour, where somebody will demand more resources by virtue of their more or less superstitious belief in the problems around them. And we give them more resources where in fact there was a problem of process. We'll buy off the problem for a period of time, make it look like it's gone away. But when it comes back, it's going to come back worse for two reasons. One is the underlying process will have deteriorated in the meantime. But secondly, we'll have rewarded... Oh, already? <laughs> Just joking. Um, that was a joke. Uh, also, the, uh, the next time we come around to the resourcing, we'll have rewarded a form of uh, behaviour which wasn't appropriate to the issue, and none of us have learned about what's going on. And so how do we create data to enable us to learn what's going on? Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, this is Mark Twain. He was, uh, and he, th th this might be apocryphal, I'm not sure, but you'll all know about this phrase. I think it was used by some British Prime Ministers in the past as well. Uh, so lies, damn lies and statistics. The reason it's up here is that there is a tendency sometimes in the senior clinical executive conversation for a complete rejection of the whole attempt at quantification, which is really what we're talking about. How do we quantify clinical systems such that we can generate meaning? Um, and, and there's a problem for people trying to answer the damn statistics issue. One is that a lot of healthcare data, data is in fact used for damn statistics in ways that is frustrating uh, for some people in the business, some, some, some of the time. But secondly, uh, in about the mid-1980s, there was a move to what was known at the time as new public management. Any of, any one of you who's done an MBA will know this NPM thing, which is the sort of Reagan-Thatcher era of this idea of we've got to make public services like businesses, and they've got to have commercial disciplines. And one of the difficulties with that is we introduced very hierarchical management structures, which weren't really appropriate to highly professionalised, highly intelligent, ethos-driven uh, enterprises like, like public healthcare. And so we, we ended up with a period of autocratic command and control attempted attempts at command and control management. It's just it's never going to work. I mean, it's just never going to work, and, and it needs abandoning. But some of the legacy of that culturally, I think, is a suspicion of information, which has to be overcome before we can begin the conversation about how uh, we might be able to give meaning. This is Pythagoras. And uh, we're moving into this era of, uh, there's, a lot of there's an awful lot of nonsense spoken about information, as we know, like big data. Um, and, uh, and um, information revolutions and the Internet of Things. Or, or so, some of these things are going to be important in some ways. I just think we don't know yet. But, but the, the quantification of our lives is, is there's no doubt that we're, all, um, that we're all moving in a direction where this is becoming more important. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that the point about this slide is that I am an absolute passionate advocate for the importance of quantification. I think it's fundamental to understanding. And the reason for that is that number series, there's, there's a big... And I'll just step back for one second. There's a really important philosophical thing going on here, which is that nobody has a good unified theory for how human consciousness understands numbers in the universe. There's, a, there's an old Socratic uh, issue about how does a child who first comes to understand um, Pythagoras' theorem, and when they grasp that and they know it then for the rest of their lives, the square and the hypotenuse, some of the square and the other two sides for a right-angle triangle, What's actually happened in that moment? What, what has been realised 
Is it something that pre-existed and the child's discovered? Or is it something that the consciousness has somehow created? So that's the formalist versus structural argument for numbers. But the point about it is that in that number world, there is a rigid, um, a rigid and strictly general form of logic which isn't subject to any human uh, a, a sort of perspectival interference. It is what it is. And there's a fundamental truth about the internal relationships of numbers, which is uh, almost mystical, hence the Pythagorean uh, concept. And um, on the other side of it, we've got natural language, which is messy, and is our sort of socially negotiated attempt to f discover truth with each other in the world. When we get information systems right, I think, there's a strange power that emerges, because we tie our natural language, which is messy and unclear and ambiguous and vague, and we tie it to a logical structure which is completely impervious to human perspective uh, shift. And if we get that bridge right, if our definitions are good, if we all agree on what we're looking at and what we're looking at is true, we can begin building a bridge between our messy language and a very reliable form of logic. The point being that if we measure something consistently over time periods, the thing that we measure tomorrow is going to be logically identical to the thing that we measured today, as long as our definitions are secure and our methods are consistent. So that's a basic scientific principle. And, and, un and that underpins uh, a lot of these ideas about the importance of quality improvement and why information is very important. I'll move on. Pythagoras was amazing. Um, said some beautiful things. He was also a little bit weird. Um, I'm, I'm taking this next comment as a... Uh, tried to myself to get on with it and he also thought beans had souls so he wasn't right about everything I don't think although although some people may disagree uh, the, the the great story about Pythagoras is he died when he came across a field of beans he was being chased by a squadron of some uh, dictator that he'd upset and um, he refused to run across the field of beans because the beans had the same entitlement to exist as he did and so he refused to trample on the beans and the soldiers caught him up and killed him so um, that's a metaphor for something. Um, you'll all have heard of Deming, presumably. Great quality guru, very interesting life Deming had. Uh, he went, uh, he, brought, he actually cut his teeth in the Second World War. I don't know if you, and many of you know the story. It's a fascinating story. The whole quality improvement movement. Um, so Deming was called on by the American government in, I think, about 1941, shortly after he entered the war. He was in Stanford, or around California at the time to advise them on how they could suddenly and quickly ramp up the production of aeroplanes safely. That was where he really did his work on uh, process design, because they suddenly had to create like 35,000 aircraft that weren't going to crash. So how do we create manufacturing processes to do that like that? And that was where the concept of standardization came. After the Second World War, the great American hegemony, because America in 1955 could do whatever the hell it liked. It was the only economic superpower, and it had just won a world war. So Deming went out of fashion because who really cares about quality when you've got an infinite amount of cash? Or you can just, you know, invade. And a um, bit of politics there, I won't do that much. Um, anyway, so, so he, he went out of favour, and it was only when he, and that was why he ended up in Japan with the car industry there, because they were struggling. And he re emerged in Japan in the 70s and 80s to defeat the American car industry, which had become very complacent by introducing some of the same methods. And then he was invited back in the 1980s in, into America as a great guru, Harvard Business Review. Times, um, times bestseller. And uh, anyway, the, uh, this guy is just a, 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 a giant, I think, and we should all think about deeming more than we do. And then Brent James, anyone heard of Brent James? He's one of my personal heroes. I've been, I've been to meet Brent a few times. He's the uh, physician director of a healthcare research institute in Intermountain, uh, Intermountain Healthcare, it's called in Utah. And uh, is one of the top 10 most influential people in healthcare worldwide. You should definitely look up Brent James and Intermountain Healthcare if you haven't already. Um, and uh, Brent's got these two lovely phrases here. There's also an interesting connection. So some of you who are, who are interested in health QI might, have, uh, might know of Don Berwick and Paul Battledon. So Don Berwick's this big, he used to be the, and ended up as the head of the uh, Medicaid, Medicare services in, in the States. Uh, set up the IHI in Boston, blah, blah, blah. So most of you will have heard of Don Berwick. And then there's a guy called Paul Battledon who set up the, uh, uh, that's a Dartmouth Atlas of Variation, which some of you might have heard of as well, which is all about why do we get very, very different outcomes in different populations. Um, anyway, the three of them were all at school together. They did the Harvard MPH at the same time in the 1980s. So, so we've got a triumvirate, which almost 
encapsulates the entire global movement on quality improvement in healthcare uh, between Brent James, Don Berwick and Paul Battledon. Interesting story. Anyway, the connection here is that it turns out I, I interviewed Brent as, a, uh, as part of a fellowship that I did a few years ago and asked him to tell me the story of his life, which was fascinating. Anyway, he studied with Deeming just before Deeming died and he went and spent a year or two with him when he was, when he was just out of Harvard. And he just moved back to, um, just moved back to Inter Mountain. For us, that, I think that's very interesting because we're coming off the back of a wave of quality improvement, probably wave one when somebody writes the history of over 150 years as kind of a wave. Some of you will have, uh, there's a couple of really seminal books, which is the two, Err is Human, which was the American Medical Association 1999 one, which basically said, I think we're killing people in hospitals and we should probably try and stop. And then there was uh, Crossing the Quality Chasm, which came about two years later, which was the beginning of the answer, the six dimensions of quality. And anyway, all of that comes from uh, a lot of thinking, largely inspired by these, uh, these three minds. And one of which was directly inspired and worked with and taught by Deeming. So we've got an interesting connection that goes through the Second World War and the defeat of fascism <laughs> through, through, through the post-war hegemony and then back into the late 20th century and into where we are today in terms of how quality improvement methodologies got into healthcare. That, that's a really interesting story, not told enough. Um, anyway, the point about data is that it's trusting relationships. It's the context of trusting relationships that allow us to change behaviours. Behaviour change really hard. I find it very hard, um, which is why I'm, you know, slightly overweight and drink too much. So um, <laughs> hopefully not too much, too much, but who knows? Uh, we need better tests for livers, I think. Um, <laughs> that might modify my behaviour if I really knew what was going on. Anyway, denial, denial is a great gift. Um, <laughs> And a problem. Trust, trusting relationships change behaviours and, and in teams and in organisations that, that's a very difficult thing to create and it takes quite a lot of time. It's not something that we've done quite quickly. Um, but actually it's stories that we tell as humans. Again, I don't want to get into all of this stuff because I've had too many cul-de-sacs already. Uh, it's stories as humans that develop those relationships with trust. And one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is how do we create information systems that allow us to, gen uh, to, 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 to field numbers that generate stories. What's going on around us? How do we understand our situation such that we can begin entering these dynamics? And, and all of that, I think, for me, in the end, is something like the... There's something in there which is going to be important for our recipe for sustainable change about public health services work. And that's such a massive question, isn't it? Because if we don't get the productivity and effectiveness right, in the end, the political will to fund universal health care without access there's a big tussle for the soul of healthcare going on, isn't there? Is it a commodity or is it a human right? And that's a fundamental difference of opinion played out in the States at the moment. It's played out in the Senate of the States right now, of course, on the, uh, on the review of the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, but I think in, 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 in jurisdictions where we've got the great privilege of having had that post-war consensus that developed universal access systems, how do we now preserve that? And I think that's a really, really important mission. And one of the ways we need to preserve it, I think, is to improve its productivity and effectiveness. And they're not the same thing. But they both require a really good appreciation of the situation. And they require an appropriately respectful professional challenge where behaviours or procedures or policies or processes are out of whack. And from a policymaker's point of view, they require the effective allocation of resources. So we misallocate resources or we don't challenge behaviours or we don't establish appropriate processes and we're going to miss and it's going to be very expensive and populations will suffer more than they need to with the present state of technology and we might lose our political consensus that healthcare is a human right. So it's, it's big stakes, I think. Is this, is this interesting at all? I'm kind of, I know, it's kind of the morning and I'm thinking, is, is this okay? Is it, is it, yeah, okay. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm really worried about wasting people's time. So some of you will have heard about microsystems, a big idea out of a, a thought about a lot in Dartmouth. And uh, this is about like the, 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 the doctor and the patient, so like the, the sacred space that we spoke about earlier on. And that's been now been expanded substantially in those roles to nursing and allied health. So there's a combination of those three professional tribes around the patient uh, with, their, with their own independent professional ethos and, and the magic that can happen when that common ground works. And then the clinical microsystem uh, which is really what, I, what I'm focused on. This is what I've become focused on. And then all of these are the various support structures up to including national uh, frameworks and reimbursement and taxation systems that support this 
uh, what actually happens where the rubber hits the road. This is really important, and there's some very interesting analytics happening in the space, all this Watson stuff and the big data stuff about reading uh, mammograms and more reliable than most doctors most of the time for some things. Really interesting space. And uh, that whole genomics thing is going to wash, wash over us. It is in the process of doing so. That's not, that's not going to be a tide that goes away. I'm not going to talk about that because I think that's, that's really fertile ground and not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about here what happens at the team level at the interaction between the team and the system and how do we get data to enable a team to understand its situation in the context of some of the wicked problems it faces. So that's an attempt to locate the level of generality that I'm uh, working at because I'm, I'm, I'm after a particular solution which is uh, if this isn't working, why? And what do we need to change? Um, and how do we know if our changes are going to work? Again, I, I'm going I'm to come out of left field soon, honestly, and just show you some stuff. Um, this is, a, this is a version of the Pythagoras thing I said at the start. But this bullet point's really important, I think, in terms of the engagement, particularly with senior clinicians. Because I think it's entirely legitimate, from a leadership point of view, to enter a debate about how we construct our data, in terms of the definitions we're using, what does it mean? And there's a very interesting issue. I spoke to some colleagues yesterday about activity-based funding and all this sort of thing. Very interesting issue about how we retranslate some of the jurisdiction level data back into the work of the clinical team. So for example, some of you might have been involved in the quite a simple sounding question. If a clinical director might say, well, can you just tell me how many hips I need to do to meet my contract? And the question is, well, it's not quite as simple as that, you see, because it depends if the patient who comes in for the hip has an ICU stay, because then they get a different DRG, and it's like, oh. And so in Queensland, we have weighted activity units. And trying to reconvert weighted activity units that inform the contract to the work of a team turns out to be the devil's job. Well, that's a pretty fundamental problem because we've got a set of people in Brisbane and Dublin and London and, you know, et cetera, reimbursing public health care on a basis which cannot be explained to the people who are doing the work. That's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that, that's, that's pathologically interesting, isn't it? <laughs> And there's a big emperor's clothes issue here about, hang on a minute, that infrastructure costs millions of dollars a year to support and it's talking to itself. I mean, it's not involved the clinical teams in the conversation, not, not either in setting it up or in, and then we get interesting because if you, uh, then we have these OECD series, very important because we all publish our national statistics and they've got to be consistent. Well, what do they have to be consistent with? They've got to be broadly consistent with the last quarter's national statistics. So there's not a point of dipping back into the business and going, does that make any sense yet? We don't even ask the question, oftentimes. We just roll on. So now we've got 27 countries around the world all comparing health data. And if you read the World Health Organization and the OECD's own publications, actually what they say is, yeah, they're not comparable. Right. But we keep publishing them, fast cost. And we don't actually reference back to the work of the work. And I think Deming will be going, what? You know, the, fund, the concept of fundamental knowledge is that the information, information that we need to make our businesses work as well as they can, our enterprises, our social enterprises work as well as they can, is contained in the people who do the work. That's a fundamental principle of quality. And yet our information systems aren't designed to talk to the people who do the work. It literally is, there's a lax explanatory force. I, I, think, I, I think this stuff's massive, which is why I'm emphasizing it. It also justifies my existence. Um, in respect of this particular strategy. So obviously I'd say that because I, I like all of us long for meaning and validation. Um, and then we've got this issue about data quality, which, uh, which I uh, hear a lot about. We're on, a, we're on a journey in our place. We don't talk about this so much now, but we used to an awful lot. Um, this idea that I've got to get relatively infrequent data and then make sure it's validated before it gets released, as if it's a wild animal that's going to go and do damage unless we tame it first. So release the data. Constrain the data, <laughs> release the data, and um, it's probably okay, you know. The data might just be there as a guide. It might be all right, like, you know, the things that come in your eyes. They're not good or bad. It just is what the world is if we get it right, you know. We have, to, we have to try and get back to some essential simplicity. But we've actually created a professional hierarchy that's about validation and release. This control system of the information as if the internal management of the definitions to render the data consistent with the last period's data means anything as if it means anything. What if it's a self-referential edifice moving through time without reference back to the work of the work? Now that itself might be okay in a slow moving business with not very much technology and not very much evolution of professional practice and no change in need. 
Oh dear. Because our business is subject to vast forces of changes in workforce and technology and capability and need. And our data systems are proceeding majestically at one day per day. But who are they informing and about what? And uh, sometimes the jury, so, so we have a so typical monthly data. We, we'll cl close a collection at the end of the month. I, I've done this, done it many times. This whole talk is the questioning of the existential value of my career. Um, I'm at that phase of life. Uh, anyway, so we, so we close the collection at the end of the month. Again, like everybody's got to submit. Oh, those hospitals are always late. Oh, we've got to wait till it's there. Oh, still got empty. What, null return? Oh, Jackie's off sick. It's not going to be till Wednesday. Is that okay? Oh, I've got a minister's brief to do. Close collection at the end of the month, and then we've got a week to validate it. Oh, hang on a minute, these two don't add up. Oh, yeah? Oh, I'll get back to you. Anyway, then we've got to check consistency of last month, just to make sure we don't get in trouble for telling the wrong story. Then we distribute it, we release the data. And then, and then, and th and then the performance team, they're thinking about central jurisdiction performance team, just go, oh, thank goodness, another month. And it's like you get over hump, and then it starts again. And then, oh. It's very stressful. It's very stressful. From a clinical team's point of view, I, the day one of month one, just in whatever series we do, happens here. And that's like a little circle of anarchic chaos. You know, coming in Tuesday afternoon, and the clinic's overbooked again, and the administrator's off, and three of my patients didn't have the notes, and two of the ones that did have the notes didn't have the test done. Uh, and don't, don't, I don't even want to think about what happened this morning in the theatres. And I go home again, knackered. And, then, and, then, and that's what happens on that day. And then I, I just add up another 15 or 20 working days like that, and that's my time period that then gets aggregated up into this report that goes through this cycle. And then we wait, and then, and then the information for the business comes back. And, and the, the earliest time period that I'm getting, if I do monthly data collections and I, I release the validated data in the middle of the following month, I've now got a six week gap between the events that happened at the start of the period and, and the events that are being described by the data that I've released that's validated. And not only that, it's at a level of aggregation that means the <coughs> The nurse, doctor, allied health person here that was with that clinic can't see their own work. They can't see their own work in that data. Interesting, isn't it? And, and then we generate a set of what we attempt to compensate this. So things like, and I'll talk specifically about these things later on when I do the demo, um, about new and review ratios for outpatients, which presumably you'll all have heard of. They're kind of a, has everybody heard of new and review ratios? So the concept being that we should we should see a certain number of new patients because they might be very, very sick. And we shouldn't see so many patients that we already know about because they're probably not so sick because we've already seen them and sorted them out. And if over time, a team's reviews start to outweigh their news and they keep bringing back patients all the time, there's no room for new patients and then we can't manage the population's emerging morbidity. But what we often do is publish our new review rates at clinical team level. So any one of the doctors in the team can go, oh yeah, I see those new review rates, terrible, that, uh, that's not me. Oh, that's not me, it's those people. You want to have a word with them? It's not me. And we can't demonstrate it, so it's very interesting. So aggregation is really important. So we get these aggregation late timelines, and the result is what I'm going to call so what data. And this is a great divide between so what data and ah data. So so what data is that stuff that goes when you look at it and you go, oh, it's interesting, but I cannot think of an action that emerges as a result of now knowing that thing. I can't think of an action. This, this concept of actionable data is really, really, it's a massive issue. It's a huge sorting hat. An enormous amount of our charts can go into it. Enormous amount, a scary number, maybe all of them. Um, because the data that we're really after is ones that's going to imply some change in the action, behavior, or beliefs, such that we can increase the meaning of the work. Okay. Moon cults. I told you it was going to be esoteric. I was up quite late last night doing this talk and I had a bit of fun. I hope it's transmitting in some form to you and you're not sitting there going, oh my God, get the demo done. I'm going to get back to work. My inbox hasn't gone away. Um, monthly data, I've just got to focus on this a little bit because it, really it really is a ritual. Um, the root of the word month 
is moon. Obvious when you think about it. Monday, moon day. So we've got into this moon cult, right? So there's 12 ritual sacrifices of data a year <laughs> to the moon goddess in the hopes that one day she'll yield meaning. So that might not be true. But I think it is. I just think it is. Why monthly? Right? Does a disease move monthly? Does a behaviour change monthly? Do relationships evolve on a month? What is it about? And uh, there's some, I think it goes, probably goes back to some like Gregorian obsession with calendars, I think. So, so bureaucratic mindset, I've been a bureaucrat, I still am one, you know, I try and, try and get over it, but it keeps reasserting itself. The bureaucratic mindset, I think, was probably so chuffed with itself in about 1352 when it figured out why the calendar didn't work. And it got that new 12 one that really does work, even including the leap year. I think it was so excited by that, that even 700 years later, we've still got to do monthly stuff. We don't mean anything. I mean, it literally doesn't mean anything. Why? What's the cadence of a moon? I mean, it's interesting for poetry. And it masks variation, right? So you go back to your deeming, variations, where are we at? Right? So this is monthly data, this is real data. And it's not anonymized because it's at institution level and I'm a director of the institution, so that's okay. So G G GCUH, um, Gold Coast University Hospital. This is our unscheduled, I'll talk a lot about the difference between scheduled and unscheduled demand because it's extremely interesting, difficult to track, hard to translate to teams, but it explains the madness of the daily life and it's where we've got to start unpicking it. Anyway, I'll talk specifically about that in the demos. Um, this is our monthly number of uh, unscheduled re requests for unscheduled echoes in our uh, clinical measurement uh, department, which is a great department. Bit chaotic, but we're doing loads of work with them, and, and it's loads better than it was. It's really good. Uh, we're, on a, we're on a good journey here. Good people. It's never the people. It, that's not true. It's a very occasion of the people, but it's very, very rarely the people. Normal distribution, one or two saboteurs, but really not very many. If you just collect monthly data and you look at that and you go, well, what idiot couldn't manage that? You know, what idiot couldn't manage that? Look, on the quietest month you had 210, and on the busiest month you had 290. How hard could that be? There's no variation in that at all, it's just dead flat. You must all be idiots. And the same for all the waiting lists and the activity and all that. I mean, hospitals just look easy when you look at them through a monthly lens. How hard can it be? And then when you look at the weekly data, it starts to get a bit all over the place because now I've got a variation that goes from 81 to 27. And on the, on the week before, I don't know which it's going to be. That's the crucial thing. It's like those things that say, download this software and you'll make a fortune on the stock market. And look, our software predicted that if you bought that stock there, you'd make a million dollars. Except it predicted it afterwards, <laughs> which turns out to be easy. Um, the problem is here, I've had a, I'm just on the back of a 55 week, and I don't know I'm going into two weeks of 37 and 27. Even if it's holidays, I don't know exactly how it's going to work. And then sometimes I might have this crazy week here with 81. But that's not the chaos of the life. It gets more like this. This is the daily data, exactly the same data series, exactly the same data series over the same period of time. And that's the daily variation. And now we go from 30 to none. And that's what I've got a roster to. I've got a roster to that. And I can't allow too much redundancy because I've got, got that many staff. So I can't overdo my roster because I haven't got enough cash to supply. I can't supply every day enough staff to manage that. And um, as a result of that, I spend half my life not able to get today's work done today and half my life recovering from the consequences of the days when I couldn't do that two or three times in a week. And that's what we've got to begin talking to and begin the conversation about. So that... That monthly thing is actually quite significant because the problem with aggregated data with relatively low frequency is that it masks the variation that's the beginning of the explanation about the difficulties of running a team in a public system with no selection. We can't control it at the bottom, particularly not for EDs. But referrals are the same. And I'm not sure we should try to either. I'm not sure that's the answer. That demand management thing, I spent quite a lot of my career thinking about that as well, and I've become a bit sceptical about it now. I think, I think there might be 20% of gains in this system if we got it right. So do we need to select? Do we need to ration? Do we need to move thresholds? And we do sometimes for effectiveness, because that's the flip side of the coin. But I'm not sure it's where we should start. And, and this all leads to this great data quality vicious circle, because we don't actually use that data to change our decisions because we can't figure out what actions to take because it's a little bit too far away. And because we don't use it in the 
life of the enterprise, it doesn't, there's no incentive for us to begin actually getting down to what's the definition mean as the count, right, blah, blah, blah. And, but until we start using it to make decisions, there's not going to be the real visceral incentive to improve its quality. So, so we, we, we get stuck and it's very hard to break out of. And then we do data quality audits. So we spend a bit more money and we go back and we try and get people to reconstruct what happened six weeks ago. And then sometimes we send in the chaps and chapesses with the dark suits and say, oh, this count's been wrong for a long time. Oh, you must be stupid. And the hospital's just going, what? What, what, what's the answer today? Sometimes, I've seen that happen. And it's a lot of that's a question of attitude as well. There might be another way to do it. This isn't great. I just, I, this idea about mass customization, there's a the paradox of mass customization. And again, I hope you'll see this in the demos. Uh, yeah, we're nearly at the end of this, this bit. Um, the paradox of mass customization is that in order to develop things which appear uh, importantly different to different users, we've got to do radical standardization of some of the support processes. So the thing that enables Amazon to tell you that people who bought this book might also like this book is a fantastic standardization of the management of the core data. So the paradox is that in order to serve things up which are unique or contextually significant to a lot of different situations, if we get it right in design terms, we'll dramatically standardize some of our processes. And, that, and that's something that we need to think about. That's quite hard in this context. But that's what we've been trying to do with some of the stuff we've done. And uh, sort of to summarize, um, we've got a desire for completeness, but that sometimes drives in frequency. And we've got a desire for consistency, but that sometimes drives a time lag. And, uh, and these ritual resource sacrifices to the moon gods, expensive. <laughs> and so this is the kind of thing that we all think about um, in terms of our information designs. And, and so we're not quite sure what we want, so we'll take everything. And we're not quite sure what we want to do, but we'll start work. And we know we've got to do this first before we start this work. And then we'll, um, and then we'll generate the reports and see if they work. And the, there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's a lot better than doing none of that. But I'm not sure it's the beginning of where we want to get to in terms of the potential of the technology we've presently got. And the problem is, well, the fundamental problem is about what, what, what should go in here. Now, some of you may be familiar with the following thing which, which drove me nuts for, for about 15 years, which was you get some problem and you say, well, I need data because, you know, we're, we're not daft. So you ask for some data, and the data might take a week or might take two weeks to come back. And it's only when you see it that you understand it wasn't quite what you needed. And so you go, oh, yeah. But now the chart I should have asked for is that one, right? And that might take another week or two. Right? And it's only when you see it, by which time the project's over. And uh, you've got, you got to publish your charts in the appendix anyway when you take it to the board and then, you know, Jimmy the explanation. Um, none of us have ever done that. Um, and that's what I would characterise as a request and respond information system, which is where a lot of us are. So we have novel problems. We, we're in context that we don't properly, properly get the definition. It's difficult to disaggregate the data. But we need to have a go, and so we end up in this debate. And I think this causes a problem between analytics teams and the business in a lot of hospitals. It sometimes there's a tense relationship. Because on the one hand, the teams are going, I'm not getting what I need. And on the other hand, the analytics teams are going, you're not asking me for what you want. <laughs> and it falls down in the middle. And, and of course, being humans, it's not that hard for us to generate conflict out of those situations. When I say not that hard, I mean we do it all the time, naturally, of course which is why we're here in evolutionary terms, because we killed all the people who didn't make it. <laughs> true, true. We're all, we're all either ancestors or beneficiaries of murderers. <laughs> That's an evolutionary fact. It's not a social comment. It's just, you know, it depends where you draw the line. But I think that's right. Anyway, um, the, the thing here is about how do we get the logic right at the get-go? such that we can kind of delight people by going, ah. And I think that's a very high order challenge. And I know that, uh, I know that it's, um, it's not non-trivial. What if, what, what if we conceptualized information systems that were entirely rooted in business needs and we built an anticipatory logic? 
and then we adjusted and refined the logic until it was definitive. So my big idea, one of my big ideas here, is that there might be there might be a definitive logic for every fundamental business problem. So a certain number of data items with a certain set of algorithms that can answer any question you might want to know about problem X. But I think that's theoretically possible. Right? And then automate it with the, to get rid of the problems of aggregation and costs of collection. So going back to the uh, ministry stuff, one of the, one of the reasons why we do monthly data, serious point, one of the reasons is it's, it's unfair to burden hospitals with more frequent collections. Right? And it is a burden, but if we, if we can automate it, which is the technological convergence argument, then we take all of that away. And there's a lot of that going on at the moment, but what if we could automate at very, very high frequencies with, uh, with anticipatory logics and then, and then serve it out? And the problem is that it's really hard. <laughs> it's hard to have uh, conversations about how true experienced needs translate into information requirements. And anticipatory logic is really hard. It, you know, it's really, really hard, in my own experience. Um, and then the adjustment and refinement requires authentic relationships. So you've got to have your trust in the context. Because, for example, if I've got a clinical team that says, you're, go you're going to use this to take resources away from me, aren't you? That's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem at the outset. And that's why the honesty has got to say, well, look, we're gonna, we're gonna, the whole point of the gig is that we're going to have to let the chips fall. But can we go together on the journey to say this is, this is an attempt to quantify and render logically consistent and attempt a definitive, uh, definitive account of the situation? Um, and then, and then that, the, the automation is really hard as well because, again, you'll all know this, but the legacy systems, so quite a lot of our administration systems are based on technologies that were found in about 1988. And, and what we're basically, well, the big vendors, they who shall remain nameless, but the big vendors basically take an awful lot of that underlying kit that had the green screen. Some of you remember those flashing cursor green screens, those pet computers, all that stuff. Oh, those were the days. Um, no, they weren't. Uh, they took all that stuff and then just basically put a web on the front of it and served it back out again. So actually the underlying engines aren't very responsive, they're not open and all that kind of thing. So it's actually quite hard to automate and I know some people in the room will have done some, bound to have done some really cool stuff, stuff in this space. But we've we found that quite difficult. And uh, yeah, I guess you'll all know about these. Can you, can you see the old woman in this picture? So you've all seen these before, these kind of, so that's where the nose is and the mouth and the woman's looking down here. And then you've got the young girl who's got the feather in her hat and that's, she's looking away. So cool. And uh, this is the duck rabbit, which again is very famous. So that, is, is, that, is that the eye of the duck facing that way? Or is, it the, is the eye of the rabbit facing that way, the eye of the duck facing that way? These are really, really cool uh, images because, uh, again, we haven't got a consistent explanation for these in the science of consciousness because there isn't a science of consciousness. The data is exactly the same, but the meaning is dramatically different and we're not quite sure what's changing. So there's lots of really interesting stuff going on with functional MRI at the moment about where your eyes fall on the image and yada, 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 but the creation of meaning from underlying data is still not well understood at all point about this is that what I'm talking about is can we do the things I was talking about before with already existing information? So the presently existing collection system. So what if we set ourselves the new discipline of no new data? What could we derive on the basis of that logic I was talking about? So I think it would have to look like this. Uh, automated, very high frequency, very short time lags, fixed logics, intuitive, patient level and patient identifiable. That's really interesting, because what we're talking about now is moving patient identifiable data into the quality improvement space automatically for the purposes of care planning, effectively. It's not, it's not the traditional sense of care planning, but I think it's entirely valid. But what that means is that the authentication systems for accessing these things have got to be at the same level as for the medical record. So it's got to be, you've got to be specifically authorized to be able to see this kind of data because it's going to lead you to a name and an address and a diagnosis. Uh, in the future. I think that whole space is really interesting about how we leverage identifiable data. I think it's got to be physician identifiable because that's the, uh, the, in terms of most of our public data sets, that's actually as an atomic unit. So for example, if you're in a hospital, you must be under the care of an attending physician at every moment that you're in the hospital for clinical governance reasons. So if something goes wrong, we've got to know who to call or who's on call for who we should call. And that's got to be true all the time. What that means is that all of the events uh, retrench back to physicians, unique, but that's actually a really interesting identifier. And they've got to be open to export. So, uh, 
just moving towards, and then we'll break for coffee, just moving towards um, my goal in this first bit of the session was to interest you sufficiently that you come back after coffee and see the demo, because that's what I want the conversations to be about. I get that. I know, it's all finished now. So, so we, built this, uh, we built this thing, built this environment, did loads and loads of testing, been at it for three and a half years now. We solved some problems, I think, uh, interesting, uh, interested in your views today. And, uh, and we got it working on the Gold Coast, got some really good value out of it. I'll show you some of our outcome graphs uh, afterwards. Um, and we did it all on the hard wires thing. So it, um, the cloud is very interesting and potentially very, very productive, but it fails the Ashley Madison test. Because right? if you can hack a website for people who are having adulterous affairs, then I'm not going to trust that technology with my healthcare data yet. So, so it's a personal issue of mine. I just don't think we're quite there yet. I know we do banking on it, but I think we're much more important than money. So for me, and again, absolutely open to this, I, just, I want to see the green flashing light and the wire where this is, and I want it behind the firewall. I want it physically located because it's got the identifiers in. So that's, that's what we did for governance. And then we did it on a multi-hospital uh, issue. So we've got 51 hospitals using the software on a daily basis at the moment over some of the scope, and I'll show you there's two different scopes. Uh, the second one's rolling out now. So patient identifiable data, obviously, just for those at uh, the right level of authentication. Physician identifiable data only for the uh, hospitals. And horizontal views, as and when. And we sort of do those on a bespoke basis, according to the chief exec's uh, forum. And again, because you're here, I don't need to over-explain this slide. Uh, so existing databases, do something cool in the middle, and then serve it out automatically with these frequencies. And then, and then there's the business logic that's the really tricky thing, and that's what takes a really long time to develop. But I think we've got some good stuff there. The data acquisition and management is a function of the business logic. So this is quite interesting. If, you have your, if you're after the minimum data that you need, because you're doing high frequencies, your volumes can increase quite rapidly. So you've got to get the smallest, it's like Occam's razor, the smallest possible number of data items to solve the business problem according to a standard logic. So that's why you've got to crack this before you can really crack this. And there's, there's iterations, of course, as we go through and do the learning. And then the presentation layer is, uh, is about the meaning and the accessibility, because you've got to be able to turn on your laptop and go, there we are, and there's me, which I'll show you, which is quite cool. Um, yeah, I don't need to over explain that, because you'll see it. And then, the, and, then, and then the automation of time series data, I think, is a massive thing at very high frequencies. So getting, getting the whole language to be about the trend and the system performance. On these, uh, on these agreed definitions. And this is me, this is the last thing I'll do. I know it's COD, and I know it's a bit cheesy, but it is a summary of what I've tried to say, because if, if we're really after effective data, such that we want to change behaviours, build trust, tell stories, but then also be able to diagnose the difference between a behaviour problem or a process problem or a resource allocation problem, which I think is a massive issue. Um, certainly not just in hospitals. Then the effectiveness of the data, I think, is driven by its frequency and its relevance and its quality. So you imp increase any of those and the effectiveness will increase. And it's also driven by the aggregation and the time lag. So reduce any of those and the effectiveness will increase. So frequency, relevance and quality over aggregation and time lag equals the effectiveness of the data, I think. And that's a paper I'm in the middle of writing at the moment. I started calling it data velocity, but I thought that was a bit pretentious. So I've gone back to data effectiveness. But I might go back to velocity because I am, in fact, a bit pretentious. Um, so we'll see how that falls. So that's kind of the summary of everything I've said in terms of the philosophy and the generalizable form of that. And then when we come back in 10 minutes or so, I'll show you what that means when it's translated into some software in our gaff and uh, see if that's of any interest. Has that, has that been OK so far? Has that been? Right, do, do, I think, uh, do you want to take do, just maybe just a couple of minutes of questions, if there are any. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried if there aren't. Oh, I'm not, I'm, oh now I know why I, now I know why I wanted them turned off. Um, so if there are any questions, I'm happy just to take them now. If, as a group, nobody asks a question, it means you all want a cup of coffee. So that's uh, wisdom of the crowds. What are you talking about when you say we have created this stuff? Is it the clinicians with the research? Yeah, it's the Centre for Health Innovation. We built a little team there of dedicated people who just do this. So it's called the MIS team in Queensland. And we started in Gold Coast, got a little bit of a business case from the board, proved the concept locally. And then the Queensland Health said, oh, that looks interesting. Could you do it for the States? And that was a couple of years ago. So that's, how, that's why we're in like 51 hospitals now in Queensland. Just, you know, just ch churning away. It's not, not, it's not a very big project. but it's, uh, so, so, that's, so there's an MIS, statewide MIS project in Queensland. That's the way. And that's been done from kind of a standing start to where we are now in the last three years or so. So, so it's pretty cool. Good question, though. I, was, I didn't explain that enough. Okay, to pick up the thread then, 
We've talked about teams, we've talked about the properties of effective information systems. I know that a lot of people are doing some cool stuff in these areas. So what I'm going to share with you next is where we're up to. And, um, and, and you'll notice that we're, we're really focused on the, the, the wicked problems at the moment about, and I'm, I'm sorry about this because you might kind of go, mm, really. But I think until we solve these issues, it's hard to build the credibility at all of the layers. So it is about waiting lists and it is about emergency department access and it is about uh, clinic effectiveness and about theatre effectiveness. So that's what I'm going to focus on um, in, in trying to apply these principles uh, to the real world. And then I'll show you some of our results. Um, so what I'm going to, what I kind of plan on doing is just kind of ploughing through. Is that okay? I've probably got about, there's actually about eight or nine applications and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through all of the functions. You'll be very grateful to hear. I'm going to pick like three, maybe two or three functions for every application just to give you an idea of it. If any of you wants to shout from the floor either during or at the end and say, can you just go back and show us a bit more of that? Then I think that's how we'll take it because that'll be the interest in the room. We'll lead it. If I try and show you the things that I think are interesting, we really will be here until 12 o'clock and uh, you won't get a word in edgeways because um, I'm interested in pretty much all of it. So, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Um, is anybody aware, just before we start, is anybody aware, this is just to make sure I don't uh, trip up in any of my comments, anybody aware of any really good predictive analytics that they're using to actually manage the effectiveness of clinical systems? Like actual numbers. Because it's, it's another big thing. I haven't spoken about it, but you can download loads of Google images because I had a look last night. Uh, predictive analytics, light bulbs. But I'm not aware of that many that actually operate and were actually validated in healthcare. Other industries have got them. I'm going to show you one anyway. So have you, have you done any predictive stuff that's really worked for you in Canterbury? Yeah, signal, we use signal, for no, signal from noise from Lightfoot. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and use that for um, predictive analysis. And what does what, what over what area? Um, mainly looking at throughput in, in the ward areas is kind of the main and trying to identify um, ward trending, um, basically on utilisation. Uh, that is interesting. I've got some I've got some bed based stuff, so I'll share that and see if that see if that resonates. That might be an interesting conversation. Okay, cool. Are you using capacity plan? Cap plan? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Right. That's that's good. Let me get on with it. Enough already. I got one other. Um, I got one other disclaimer to make before we start, which is uh, that there's a bit of an irony here, which is three of the functions in this first demo are going to be quite slow. And the the irony is that because I've had to anonymise all of the applications and put them on this laptop, they're actually much faster on the network. So uh, I know that I know that yeah, I would say that, wouldn't I? But um, you're just going to have to trust me. So. So let's set out on the journey as if we've got to, if, as if we've got a problem with our elective surgery waiting lists, and we're either we've either got a difficulty now, or we're doing okay now. We want to make sure that as things change, we can sustain our performance. And so, applying all of the principles we've got, what what does it look like for us? So this is this is the uh, this is the classic total number of people waiting for any operation. Um, and the thing to highlight, and I know some of you have got some stuff like this, is like so we're going for this very high frequency stuff. So this uh, this demo set was uh, downloaded uh, from uh, last Tuesday. So in our, in our place, when you log on and you got your authentication, you see yesterday's data. So we're trying to wash up all the clinical decisions we made yesterday and putting them in some kind of discipline format. So, so this is fairly standard stuff. That's that, that's that uh, total number at the top broken down according to the specialties. So uh, with each of the individual doctors, uh, again, no surprises on the list of specialties, we've all got those. And orthopaedics is to surgical waiting lists, what diabetes is to chronic disease. It's always the test case, right? And uh, that's true in the real world. If you can sort out orthopaedics, you're halfway there in terms of resolving your relationships and your uh, performance, yeah. uh, particularly the relationships. Uh, I, I love orthopaedic surgeons. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's, that's true, I do. I, I actually, all the doctors, amazing work, and spent a bit of time seeing practice, and it's fantastic the work that they do. But they do have the certain cultural, uh, the certain cultural consistency. I've worked in five hospitals. I, I was trying to calculate the number of hospitals I've done some performance improvement in. I think it's north of, north of 130, because we've done some, quite a lot of government work as well in the last 18 years. And uh, some, some cliches are valid. Anyway, um, if we now click into the orthopaedic category three waiting list as of yesterday, we can see all of the doctors with at least one patient waiting, which is fairly cool. And then if we go into uh, one of my doctors, this is where we get some of the predictive uh, analytics stuff. So this, um, so this chart down here, 
This is the waiting list as of yesterday, so the actual number of patients on the surgeon's list. And this line here is unique to the surgeon. And what that's so, I was, this is about two years ago, I was walking near the canteen in the hospital and the director of orthopedics said, there's more than a thousand patients on my waiting list. You told us to do more work in outpatients and we did, and now I've got more than a thousand patients on my waiting list. And uh, all of which was true, because I, I did, we had done a strategy like that because we had problems with outpatient waits and there were more than a thousand patients on the list. And he, uh, he said it loudly. Um, and I said, uh, well, how many patients could you have on your waiting list and still treat them in time? And there was a little pause. And he realised and I realised that neither of us had a good answer to that question. But it's a pretty basic question, right? So if I've got a surgeon that's got N number of patients, is that too many for that surgeon to still treat them all? And actually, we didn't know. So we developed this. Uh, this is just what I'll just do this one in detail. You'll see, you'll see some of the other stuff as we go through. So we developed this, um, it's not complicated maths, but it's a very interesting algorithm and it turns out to have some good force. Um, so I can individualise this to every, every doctor by looking back on the stuff they've done in the past because systems tend to behave reliably because people are creatures of habit in general. Not always, but in general. So if I look at the average number of activity and removables by the doctor and the urgency, and I can look at the number of patients I've got, or the, uh, the number of months I've got available to treat patients. Do you have like CAT 1, 2, 3, 1, 3 and 12 here? Does it work like that at all or is it a different system? I know Ireland have got this as well. Your surgical waiting list. You've got urgency and routine, have you? How does it? Urgent and routine. Okay, so you'll have different, you'll have different time bands. It doesn't matter, the logic works the same. And, and then we take 15% off because it's an imperfect world. We can then come to a reasonable answer. And again, we're not trying to land this on a sixpence. We're trying to say, can we have some guides? And so we developed this thing called the nominal wait list maximum. And this is unique to each surgeon. And it's essentially a capacity measure that says, can you give me an idea that the point when I've listed too many patients and I'm probably going to get into trouble meeting my targets down the line. And because we've got some uh, long waiting time limits, 9, 12 months in uh, Queensland, we've actually got loads of time to figure it out, how to do the teaming and ladling or whatever when it comes down the line. And then, we, and then we coded it for every doctor. So it turns out to look a bit like this, just going back in the application. Uh, this black line here, and this is, what, this is one of those things about validation. So I can now click on this and we, we do this quite a bit. It's obviously um, anonymized here. Um, but this is, this, is, uh, this is some doctor, and when we're, when we're in our place, that's the doctor's name there. And here's the urgency categories, the amount of times we got to treat the patients. And this is how many patients we actually treated and removed, or that surgeon actually treated and removed in the last 12 months. And this is a really powerful moment then, because we can click, click, click and sit down and say, is that right? Has that got face validity? Is that roughly right for the work that you do for your urgents and your routines? And they know, right? Surgeons know about their practices in general. So that gives us good validity, and if they go, no, that's way off, you got the wrong person, then we've got a mapping issue or we've got a quality issue because it's yesterday's data, it's absolutely real time. And so then we can look at the total number of patients removed, the average numbers removed in a month by that surgeon by urgency, and then we can say, given the number of months we've got to treat the patients, what's the, roughly, what's the, what's the amount of patients that we... Um, that we can bear on our list and still treat people in time. And then we take 15% off that number because the world's imperfect and we want to allow latitude at the back. And then we compare that with the actual waiting list as of this morning. And, th and that, that number is one of the things that we use as a guide. And this particular surgeon at this particular point in time, i.e. now, if everything stays the same and we don't do anything about it, then they're likely to get into trouble in about uh, somewhere between six and nine months from now. And, and what's really nice about the uh, calc is that it's served out automatically every day and updated automatically. So each surgeon's as the, if you drop a couple of sessions, then your throughput starts to go down and your, your wait list maximum falls as well. So it adjusts naturally. It's, it's not overly complicated, but it's quite cool. And it's pretty simple. And it also enables us to do automatic validation. What's really nice about this is that once you start having that conversation, the conversation changes because it's almost like, mm, well, that's actually quite interesting. And, uh, and it also means that we can start, we can start changing our language. So one of the things we talk about quite a lot now is heavy or light order books. So we can say this surgeon's got a pretty heavy order book for his category three work and actually pretty heavy order book for his category two work. And what that means is that we want to probably pull back on his outpatient appointments because if we do that, that'll float back down towards the line and everything's going to be okay because it's a dynamic system, right? It's, we don't have to panic. We've just got to take the appropriate corrective measure. And then, but, and, and, and the mood, the, the dominant form of the conversation is that everybody's heavy and busy all the time and we can't possibly do anything. And don't ask me to do anything more or different because it's all too hard, which, which, is, which is understandable when you're working in the clinical team because you haven't got really good situation analysis. 
but it's also subject to confirmation bias. So you have these very busy days where people feel, and you really remember those, they're emotionally vivid, and it's a little bit like post-traumatic stress. And so you think everything's chaos all the time, but actually some days aren't like that, but we don't remember those days and we can't track them. So, so, and also when we look across teams, it's not the case that everybody's got a heavy order book all the time. And I've noticed an interesting correlation, which is that the clinical directors, the ones who argue for resources in the rooms, tend to have heavier order books. But it's the teams behind them in which there's a huge amount of variation and from a resource allocation point of view, some redundancy or some opportunities for change. But there's no, it's difficult to construct the language about saying, well, it's, it's actually an interesting phenomenon. Actually, yeah, you have got a heavy order book and I do want to talk to you about distributing your list or changing your clinic to 30 ratios because that's, that's going to, we're going to struggle for that. But Dr. QWSH, not so much. So what do we need to talk about that? Has that, has that doctor got too many theatre sessions? Well, that's a sacrilegious claim. Or, or do we need to do more outpatient new slots so that we can manage the patients who we've not yet differentiated? And it, it starts a whole new debate about, um, about what's going on inside the teams and refreshes that every day and then connects it to people's activity. And then what's quite nice, this is a general feature of the system. This is the thing that's slow. I'm going to click this one. It's going to be a bit slow. And I'm going to click another one. It'll be a bit slow. But the rest of them should work okay. It's actually because it's churning. <coughs> Long story, but it's churning the statewide data behind it. So. Uh, da, 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 da. Again, when, I'm, when we're at the ranch, that's a uh, blink of an eye stuff. So every waiting list by specialty, by doctor, by urgency, against the weight of the order book, distributed now by procedure, I click into the procedure, and now I can see the patients. And those, th those, that's the patient names delivered to me every day according to the cohort by which doctor and which urgency they sit in against actually their level of delivery risk. And we'll see that time and again as we go through. So that idea about patient identifiable data being served out, connected with a logic that tells us where we might want to intervene. And in, in this particular case, we might say, well, we've got a set of procedures here that another surgeon can do and you're very heavy, so can we talk about moving them over? And here's the patient names with all of the information that we need. And I can kick that out to Excel and use that in whatever other forms I want. So it's open, open at the bottom. And it's one of the metaphors I use for this is that it's a little bit like if you're, you might remember from childhood or if you've had kids, um, where you've got a kind of a rock pool on a beach and, and it's a windy day. You can't really see what's going on underneath. But if you put your goggles on and put your head down like that, then suddenly the whole thing becomes very clear. And that's one of the metaphors I think we're trying to reach for with the data is that it becomes very, very clear once you've got the right lens on because you can take all the surfaced um, disturbance off and just look at what the flora and fauna are underneath and actually there's a set of pretty stable logical objects that are amenable to action and it becomes very interesting. So uh, is, that, is that interesting at all? Is that, is that quite cool? A little bit. It's, I don't think it's the best stuff we've got but it's, um, but it's kind of a good starter. So that's all very well in terms of the waiting list. And what we're trying to do there is say that's, that's a simple down payment. That was the first thing we built on could we get a definitive logic. And I think that gives you all the information you could need to manage a surgical waiting list. And I'll show you the impact that had uh, in, in our place. Um, but that's, uh, that's just a very quick one. Again, that's not, the, uh, that's not really the cool stuff. Because really we want to know about the future, right? And we want to know about where we are compared to what's going to happen next rather than what's already happened. So I'll just show you briefly um, uh, Metro North, but I won't go into any details. So some of our, some of our hospitals, Queensland, are still struggling with quite a lot of patients uh, that waited too long. And we've also got an issue about booking to breach. So sometimes we have teams that book patients such that if they come in at the time when we've been booked, they will have waited too long. And it's an interesting phenomenon. Um, about the ability to get your scheduling systems right. And then also leading indicators. So that's what it looks like when you're, uh, if you check out the x-axis there, we've still got some uh, significant numbers. When you look at our place, uh, this, these charts themselves become leading indicators of the stability of our performance. So we occasionally have people flicking up, but these will tend to be data errors or particular issues, or if we have a big rain event or something like that, which does sometimes happen. But if you look at the x-axis here, it's ones, two, threes, fours. And in terms of the book to breach, we don't really do that anymore because we've pulled the uh, target systems back a little bit ahead of time. And then what's quite nice down here is that we can, we can track now. We use this a lot. This is, these are now the leading indicators. So again, working on the waiting list, if I've got 90 days to treat you, if you've waited more than 60 days, you'll come up in an unbooked at-risk category there. So I can go in in the morning and I can say, OK, in my ENT surgery, have I got any patients who, if I don't get offers to relatively quickly, they're going to breach? So that, that gives me a good guide to the future. And we coded those uh, to, to give us at least a month for the uh, CAT 2s. 
for the cat ones that we've got to treat within um, 30 days, we give ourselves four days. And then our booking officers can work through these lists and it just automatically churns them. So the algorithm that we've now got for this is really stable and secure. And it means that we can flag and escalate ahead of time for cohorts of patients that have got identified needs, but for which we haven't got the identified capacity. We haven't actually put the appointment in. And where that reflects, um, and where that reflects an underlying issue, we can, we can target that. So if we've got no blacks on the... Um, if we've got no blacks on the left hand and no reds on the right hand, then we're absolutely in control. And if our pinks are relatively low, then we're in good shape. And that's, that's basically the uh, pattern recognition we use to mean that we're in the control here. And every now and then we'll get a, a patient that's booked beyond breach, but that might be, for example, a patient who's been suspended and then has come out of suspension or will be treated in the month. That kind of thing still happens because uh, patients say, oh, I'm going on holiday. Well, it's weird, isn't it? But um, we still have to honour all of that and uh, normal public service stuff. And then this is quite a nice chart because this uh, throws out to the future now. So the x-axis now isn't the past, it's the future. So this enables us to sort of drop the waiting list forwards and see how it falls. So if we go back to some of those earlier charts, we've got this interesting variation in distribution of doctors in terms of the weight of the order book and the balance of procedures, which is inevitable because subspecialisation. But then when we look at that same... Um, information through time, we get some interesting views. And again, this, this is an interesting conversation about uh, we're all busy all the time. Um, I can throw out any list from any doctor now the next 12 months. And we can look at how, how hectic it is and what the variation is in terms of the future bookable demand. And when you look at the waiting list in that way, looking ahead, it's clumpy. And it makes perfect sense, of course, because if you do a lot of outpatient clinics in one week and then go on a conference for two weeks, you're going to have different um, uh, weights of listing. And so your time, your future time, that's already committed and has to be done within a period, is, is, going to be, uh, is going to have a lot of variation in it. So when you can look at that every day, it changes the conversation again because, yeah, if we did nothing heading up to this week and these weeks, we're going to, we're going to start to worry. But I see a solution. And uh, we might be able to just pull forward some of these bookings because we've got quite a few weeks where there's nobody we need to treat to make sure nobody breaches. And again, you can just do like funny things like I could click in here and I could find the three patients I've got to treat in the week of the 9th of July 2018 to make sure that I don't have anybody breaching my uh, waiting time targets. And that gives us lots of time to plan. And what's interesting, if we get surprised by surgical waiting lists, it's got to be a failure of data frequency and disaggregation, right? Because that, that list is only aging at one day per day. So the only reason we haven't responded to it is almost willfully ignored the fact that that patient has headed at one day per day towards the time threshold and then tipped over it and then carried on waiting past it. And once we can see these things at physician level, it's a different conversation with the surgeons about saying, actually, what we could do is this. And one of the things we've started talking about quite a lot is about using information systems, which I didn't talk about in the setup, which was more about the sort of logical philosophy stuff. But the cultural thing's very important as well. So we're, so we're thinking a lot now in terms of the way we organize our conversations about de-stressing healthcare. If we can get the data right and we can be a little bit smarter about how we do resource allocation and if the deal becomes more adult to adult and more mature and we can come out of crisis, then actually we could begin to de-stress public healthcare by putting the problems in the right place. And I'll show you in a little while when we get into some of the outpatient uh, capacity stuff. I'll, I'll do that now actually. Um, one of, the, one of the deals we've got with one of our teams at the moment, which is driven by, driven by the stuff. And even though the performance at the moment is really bad, we're okay because we, we understand what's going on. We've accepted the case. We've proved it beyond reasonable doubt. And it's going to take us six months to recruit the doctors that we need to fix it. And so we just have to accept that's where we are for now. And our board understands that. And if our performance, oh, it's actually taken longer than that because it's international recruitment in this case. But if our performance doesn't transform between February and June next year, and we can watch it every day, then the application of those new resources will have failed. And that's a different type of conversation. And now we've got less stress between the leadership and even the Department of Health and that team because we've got a deal, we've got a plan, we know what we're doing and we know when it's going to kick in and we can track it each day. So it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of conversation. Is this cool at all or is this like, oh yeah, we've all done this? I was a little bit worried about that because my, my nightmare is that everyone's looking at me going, yeah, we did that 10 years ago, what are you talking about? Uh, which would have been a problem. Um, okay, good. So, so that's the waiting lists. But waiting lists are a bit dull. I totally accept that, and um, this is where I think we're doing some cool stuff. I'm going to spare you the waitlist auditor, but I think this is potentially really quite cool. And again, when we're in our when we're in our place, it's like you click on, do you log in, and you're just straight in. But I've got to go through this because it's a demo demo application. 
we're interested in weighting this because they're a symptom of something going wrong in our capacity and demand analysis, or they're a symptom of a lack of resources, or they're a symptom of a problem of processes or a problem of behaviour. But we're not in, they're not a causal, you can't get to the causes of the problem from the weight in this, they're slippy. And, and you, can, uh, you can have no weight in this and catastrophic resource use, and you can have a weight in this and a resource problem, but good resource use. But we really need to have the conversation about resource use and about demand and capacity analysis. Right? So all of you in the room who've done quality improvement of one form or another uh, will, will recognise the interest that I had in saying, well, could we automate capacity and demand analysis? If I could automate that and get all of the right stuff in the right place and put it up there every day, then we could have a different conversation. Because in my experience, doing QI stuff, a lot of related to weight in this, but not just that. Doing capacity and demand analysis is really hard and it's a really difficult thing to ask for the right thing over the right time period and get the referrals right and then all the different sources of the inputs of the referrals and then the clinic stuff, that's hard. And it's hard to get it disaggregated. So anyway, we tried to do that and um, this is what we ended up with. Again, I'm not going to show you every function, but uh, quite excited by this. I think this is cool stuff. Um, so this is all of our um, this is all of our specialties, and this is now automated. This, this refreshes every uh, every week. And what we've done here is we've um, just moved this to daily. Actually, what we've done here is we've calculated the amount of input demand into the ambulatory care for each of these specialties against the average number of new slots that we do related to that level of urgency, and then we recalculate that every week. And then we can look at the balance. So, how many extra appointments do we need, or how many spare appointments have we got compared to the demand? And, and this, this is the beginning, again, of a whole new conversation because it exposes all kinds of very interesting wrinkles. So we have to compare the difference between just business as usual or business as usual with uh, including our weight and list initiative clinics and various other things. So we have to factor all of that in. And basically what we've come to is that if you can get, if your balance is somewhere around 10% of your total activity, you can probably get to where you want to be in terms of your position by improving the effectiveness of the scheduling and the chronological management and all of the sort of standard techniques that we've got. Much more than that and you're out of whack. Oh, just a comment that I didn't make about the um, nominal waitlist maximum is that we, uh, our experience has been, and this is the nice thing about numbers, the, our experience is that you can actually bear about 130% of that nominal waitlist maximum and not breach. Interesting. And that's because we've already taken 15% off and we can team and ladle. And there's sometimes a difference between the urgency categories and surgeons are smart. So, so bearing 130% of the nominal weightless maximum is achievable, much more than that. And we start saying, let's wind back. Um, so a similar thing here. We're developing these rules about what, uh, what the algorithm needs to be to answer the question about what's going on in the clinic at aggregate effect. And, and if we're getting about 10% here, uh, we can manage it much more than that. And we can't. But... When we started the work, the teams came back and said, yeah, well, that's not the point. Yeah, we get all the written referrals and the GP referrals, and I know we've got the weight in this, but it's all the stuff that's coming into the clinics that doesn't even get written into a referral, either from ED or from the very hot referrals that come from our colleagues, and they're taking our capacity away. So when we look at the new slots against the waiting list, it's a completely false measure because some of those new slots aren't even hitting the waiting list. They go into other emergent demand, which is nothing to do with that uh, ministerial target. That's interesting, isn't it? And so we, we really dove into that really hard and it, and it turns out to be true. Uh, back to Deming again and the people who've got the knowledge are the people who do the work. So what we did is we break, broke out the demand, i.e. the stuff that's coming in that bears on the clinic between scheduled and uh, demand not from the waiting list. We're trying to use neutral language. And basically what we're saying is for every one of our teams now, we can calculate every week and recalculate every week the average number of slots that are required that are never going to hit the weight and store the scheduled care system. Now, in some cases, we might want to ask questions about that and say, well, actually, where are they coming from? But it gives us exactly the patients that we need to start asking about to say, how are they hitting the clinics and is that okay? And is that what we want? So um, I'll just show you that. That's an interesting, uh, orthopaedics is interesting again, but if I show you ophthalmology, it's one of our challenge specialties at the moment. Um, again, a good, a really good crowd, but, but performance challenges in terms of access. And the story is very different. And um, their balance equation is out by a factor of about 30%. And we're not going to performance improve our way out of that. There just isn't enough of the stuff and time needed to see the patients that need to be seen in that time period. And so that's one interesting thing, which is why I said, yeah, that's true. The inpatient stuff is okay, but we just need more doctors here because the way the regulation system works is we can only do so much of the advanced practitioner and the nurse practitioners. We've got to get medical eyes on because obviously you can go blind. And um, we've got to make sure, particularly for the news. So 
two interesting thing is, one is that we're way out of whack in terms of our balance and we, we automate this, but secondly, we've got really, really high demand coming into these clinics, which is what that team told us. And this, and this again is really nice thing to be able to go back and go, yep, you were right, and we can demonstrate it, and these are the numbers. Does that look right? And it's like, yeah, I think that's about right, actually. And therefore, we can calculate what the plan needs to be to get us back into balance and give us a sustainable, uh, a st a sustainable performance improvement. So now, now we have conversations a little bit like, you know, the gap between these lines is the slot gap that we've got to fill. We need strategies now to procure 33 more slots a week for ophthalmology to cope with the actual presenting demand that we can prove is coming in every week. And we can either, and, and then we have a different conversation about new and review ratios, which I'll show you some of the sub stuff for. Um, because we could actually, we could, we could close some of that gap by doing a new deal with the GPs to manage our glaucomas and macular degenerations, and that'll take out 23% of our review clinics, and therefore. And so the whole thing moves into a different space in terms of the model of care, as well as the performance thing. Is that interesting? I think, I think this is really cool. It's not the best thing, though. I'm going to show you the best thing now. <laughs> uh, I think this is the best thing. I'll just, I'll just, again, if you want to drop back into this, because it's demand, demand and capacity, and capacity, so it's not a complicated logic. Um, but it is hard to do and actually knit it together. And some of these things aren't quite completed yet. On the demand side, though, we've got referral categorization. So everything that lands, has it been given an urgency yet? And that's very, very variable between different teams. And uh, as, as you have some, some murmurs of agreement there. And these are the kind of quality measures that drift around, that people know are important, but it's hard to get to, and then automate something so we can actually fix it. So, so if I was to go into my... New, oh, bless them, nutrition. So, so they've got a couple that are out of whack in terms of the referrals. What's nice about the system is I can click, click, click with me nutritionist. I can say, there's the two patients. Somewhere in our hospital, we've got those two referrals that you haven't given an urgency categorization for and they've waited too long for that categorization. So could we go and find them, please? And we've had some very interesting cases where the nurse, uh, the senior nurses in the teams taken the system, click, click, here's 16 referrals. I can only find 12. Serious, isn't it? I mean, it's a fundamental issue about we get and we log them on, and sometimes they go astray. Nobody's doing anything wrong, but they're sometimes physically moving before the scan or whatever it is. So we've got to double back to the GP and say, could you resend? And that gives us a clinical governance security at the front that says we can now monitor the referral as it arrives by team, back to our earlier conversations, and, uh, and then by identifiable patient to say, can we ensure that every referral that comes in gets its urgency and then makes its way into the system in the appropriate, uh, the appropriate priority? The new outpatient waitlist trends um, is a version of the uh, uh, thing I showed you before about the surgery stuff. Review schedule trends, very interesting. So we had a lot of issues of, uh, from our teams about, oh, it's the reviews that are killing us. And we were, uh, and so we said, oh, well, let's have a look at that then. So we can begin to look at how many reviews are actually being generated. Uh, so this is the total review demand for the team. So that's all patients with a future booked appointment at any time back into that service that have already been seen by the service. Very interesting. And this is the total review demand by doctor. This is really, really interesting. So I can say, oh, uh, hello, Dr. X. You said we've got this problem with your reviews. Well, this is the next 13 weeks of your reviews. And this is the number of patients who are coming back repeatedly. And if we look at the patients you've got booked next week, here they are. And this is the patient identifier. So what we've essentially done is reduced the time to clinical audit to almost zero. Because now I can get a junior doctor or a nurse practitioner. I can click them here, and then they can go and start doing the EMR reviews and say, this is the profile of the reviews that are coming back. And again, this, some of you all know yesterday, this is, this is what we're using to drive the urology conversation about the uh, PSAs uh, for men not, not appropriate for surgery and whether or not we can do uh, community-based solutions for that. Well, we can see it, and it's 9% of our review demand, it turns out. And these are cool numbers, you know. And there must be international standards for this because all the doctors are similarly trained. So there will be a, rain, there'll be a variation. So every public hospital in the world is about 410 in the English-speaking world. Uh, every big hospital in the world will have a urology department, and in those urology departments, there'll be a certain number of patients coming back for a review who've got a raised PSA that could be managed in the community. As a global public health community, we've got no idea what that number is, and no benchmarking is asking that question. But that's a really important question for the present state of technology and how we optimise care and make it effective and personalised. So this is kind of the down payment on the types of things we need to do. Um, so that's the demand management uh, screens and again this is all automated and then we've got the high frequency review patients again this is an interesting thing that comes up about have we got patients to churning around and around and around that we should really discharge and the answer is yes we have 
and uh, this is this is the patients now by order of the number of reviews we've had in the last two years and some of these are entirely appropriate it's absolutely fine because some are rare cases that need very very frequent intense management but some of them need a conversation about effectiveness and whether or not we could have a different deal with primary care to better manage those cohorts that's not the really cool stuff I think this is the really cool stuff <laughs> I'm teasing you. Is this interesting at all then? Uh, is, this really, is it really interesting? You know, from can have you done all this in Christchurch, by the way? Is this kind of, yeah, yeah, for you? Uh, certainly no, we haven't done all this. Okay, cool. So the trip wasn't totally wasted for you then, was it? <laughs> cool, that's, that's really good. That's good. That's a, that's a high bar, as far as I'm concerned. Um, this is the really cool stuff, right? So when you think about outpatients and you think about clinics, and you think, oh, it's just so big and it's just so hard, and there's just so many of them. And, and we, we try and put these measures on to tame the beast before we release it to the wild. Um, these new to review rates at team level and all that kind of thing. So we had this big insight. It's a bit of an epiphany moment for me as I was doing this work with the teams. And we were saying actually new to review ratios, I, I mentioned this before at team level, they're pretty much useless, they're irrelevant. Because each individual doctor says, so that's not me. And the same for conversion rates to surgery. So orthopedics got a conversion rate, we all have 25 to 35%. But if Dr. X has got a conversion rate of 50%, because he's got a physio triage service over here, then he's got a completely different treatment for how he should manage his flow. So somebody who's got a conversion rate of 15% because he does interesting feet. And so the thing is, it's unique to the surgeon, it's fundamental, and, and, and for the medics as well in, in interesting ways. So the big problem is, how do we organise the data, going back to this anticipatory logic? And um, it, it, this is why it's hard, but I think we've done it. I'm going to share it with you. So we developed this thing called trend calendar trend analysis. Right, so I'll show you what it is. So just new and review appointments just focus on this kind of classic canard of policy. And this is, this is functioning now. This is a working software. So this is the last 26 weeks of throughput through our orthopedic clinics in our place. And the blue bars are the new appointments that we saw and the uh, pink bars are the review appointments that we saw. And so it's interesting, the variation is interesting, and we, we do have conversations about that. So the best week in terms of throughput, we got through 139 patients, and in our quietest week, we got through 55, and that'll be conference week or whatever it was. And um, no problem with conferences, we've got, to, we've got to keep up with our skills and knowledge, but we do need to factor it in when we're doing capacity and demand analysis. So the variation in the supply is interesting in itself. But if I click one of these bars now, this is where we get a bit of magic, it throws up the calendar of what actually happened last week. Right, so this is the start of a whole new conversation. So when I started in the Gold Coast, it was like, have we got any outpatient data? And, it, and the answer was yes. And I got sent a PDF, a PDF um, that had red and green bars on it going up or down with percentages of something. I, I was reading it. I was going, oh, you know, it's kind of the ultimate so what document. A, I couldn't figure it out. And B, I think even if I did understand it, I'm not sure it would tell me anything I needed to know. So, so we were thinking about outpatients a lot, doing a lot of work with the teams. And so this is, the, this is, this is what actually happened last week in our orthopaedic clinics by day. So the, we saw the trend. This is now the calendar bit. And now if I go into some sub-doctor here, it doesn't matter, the doctor's names are anonymised, I can see what clinics they did last week. So, so this is my doctor names down here, and, I can, and this again is validation. Do you do Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons? If the answer is no, we've got a problem with the mapping and we've got to sort out the clinic codes. And as we know, sorting out the mapping of the clinics to the information system is a massive issue. Some hospitals have drifted so far away because it takes so long to get in touch with the administrator over there to do, they just forget it and you work around and everyone knows that Tuesday morning is Dr. Smith, but the information system thinks it's Dr. Jones. But it's been like that for three years and why fix it? Because nobody asks, it don't really matter. And you know, but when you try and do capacity analysis, it becomes a fundamental problem because then you could take your data back and the doctors go, oh, that's not me. And, and how, how, how are you gonna know? Anyway, so, we, so you can know by doing this and going, do you do Tuesday mornings and Thursday afternoons? Because we've actually got names up here. Obviously, we've not got names here. But we have names here, and we sit down and say, is that you? Yeah, it's you. And then we go, oh, well, uh, okay, that's interesting. So um, Tuesday's obviously your sort of juniors clinic, and Thursday's is, your, uh, is where you do um, your stuff and do your news and your reviews. Doesn't seem to be a lot of news going through Tuesday mornings. Oh, yeah, well, that Tuesday morning was unusual. Right, so I go, okay, so what if we look at the last 26 Tuesday mornings that you did <laughs> and, uh, and look at the new and review ratios for those clinics that you do? Could that be right? So now we click on Tuesday mornings of Dr. X, and this is the last 26 weeks of that clinic by its new and review rates. Now that's, that's a different conversation in terms of new and review ratios, because this is you. And that might be okay. There's absolutely no judgment on this at this stage, but it's about, is that interesting? And is it helping, when we add all of your different ambulatory care practices together, is that helping us achieve our mission? 
which then begs the question, what the hell is our mission? And have we ever had that conversation? Because we actually just turn up and do stuff, don't we? We don't think about how does that add up in terms of productivity or effectiveness. So what's, what's nice about this is that if I can then click on me uh, last week's Tuesday morning clinic, it's all reviews and here they are. So there's the patients who actually went into that clinic last week and were seen as reviews with a little bit of information about them in terms of including the number of reviews they've had over the last two years. So is this clinic just a call and recall clinic and do we need to do some discharge work? And even if not, do we need to do a little bit of audit on these patient records and say, are there cohorts in here that we should begin developing alternative models of care for? So again, it's the beginning of a different conversation and that's automated. So we can look at that every week in terms of what's actually going through the clinics. This is for me, this is magic, because it just completely changes the conversation. And not only that, it changes the level of respect between the senior physicians and the leaders, because it's like, oh, that's, you're talking my language now. And some of it might be uncomfortable, but it's pretty cool. And you'll, you'll know this, I guess, from the Canterbury Christchurch thing. Once you start presenting this data with these kind of frequencies, it changes the tenor and nature of the conversation with the clinical teams. And not only the clinical teams, but the individual practitioners. And what we hear time and again is, no one's ever shown me anything like this before. And, that, and that's, what, uh, that's what kind of makes it worth getting up in the morning. So that trend calendar trend stuff... Is, uh, is I think really cool and that's the, that's the best thing we've done in terms of outpatients. And um, again, as I was talking before about these conversions to elective surgery, I'm still in orthopedics now, no, that's okay. Trend calendar trend, these are all the patients who we saw in clinic who ended up getting a, a surgical, addition to a surgical waiting list. And again, as I was talking before, we can, it, it doesn't matter who, some doctor here, um, on your Wednesday mornings you saw 43 uh, appointments uh, you added six, and that's your distribution over the last 26 weeks of the number of productive appointments you did in your hand review, and here's the number of patients you add to the list off a Wednesday morning. So we can see the variation in the behaviour of the system, so we start to really understand uh, the profile of demand, which was one of our goals. And then um, I'll just, I'll just prepare one other thing to show you before we get out of outpatients, and I'll show you the third stuff. Um, Da, da. Sorry about this. The, these are the moments where I think, yeah, we've got some. We need to do a new version of this to make it much more intuitive, because we've come a long way, but we've still got some way to go. So I just just flipped it. I don't want the medics to feel left out. So looking at cardiology, uh, it's quite interesting because what we've got in terms of the doctor selections here is that we can look at the last 26 weeks by uh, summary, and we can look at the we can begin to look at the uh, profiles of the. Um, We can begin to look at the profiles of the new and review rates and then sum it up and then say, I've got a doctor. So what's, what's beginning to emerge for us is the concept of physician profiles of practice that require different types of conversations. So, for example, we've got some colleagues who, who do relatively light clinics, if we're honest, and, it, and it's something that it needs a gentle and a respectful conversation, but there is a significant variation and, 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 and we need to talk about that. We've got some colleagues, it turns out, that have a relatively low number of news and a high number of reviews and a very low discharge rate. Now that's an interesting profile of utilisation because it means that we're running what is a, a, a relatively safe practice. We're not seeing a lot of new risk and we're, we're bringing the risk that we've already seen back time and time again. Now that might be okay because I might be a subspecialist. So for example, I might be a neurologist doing Parkinson's and I've got my register and they're the people in the population. But if it's a general clinic for something that's a chronic disease management, then it might mean that we're essentially running a primary care clinic in a secondary care space and we need to discuss what level of population risk we're managing with that level of professional seniority. And it's that level of conversation which dovetails with what we spoke about yesterday about population risk that I think starts to pull the thread of where we need to go as an industry in terms of maximising the effectiveness of our resources. Right. How are we doing? Is this okay? Mm -hmm. Right, we're sort of going left to right. Looks at the waiting list, looks at outpatients, uh, demand and capacity, demand management, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of other stuff, but I'm not going to show you any more there. I can't, I'll go back to it. There's no problem with that. Uh, save changes to that. No, no, fingers crossed. Always makes me anxious to save changes because you're like, oh, I lost three hours work. Um, back, 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 back. Theatres, theatres are cool.
So again, based on this idea, it added a very high frequency information back to the teams, blah, 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 blah. What would it look like? So for us, the logic, and again, we're trying to go off this definitive logic. How, what's the our algorithm set that's going to explain what's going on? So we kind of did a lot of work on the elective schedule, the forward view, a lot of work on session allocation, a lot of work on utilization. And again, we want to try and turn these things back around to the doctors and the teams. So we'll, we're interested in the future. And this is now, what do I need? If I've got some issues with my waiting list, and I either need to fix it or I need to sustain my performance. And this is what's actually going through the theatre block uh, today. Um, and this is the next, well, it's not actually, it's last week, but it's when the demo was downloaded. So this, this, is, this is this week, and this is the next five weeks, where the dark blue is the number of minutes we've already committed in our total theatre blocks, and the light blue is the number of minutes we've got available to commit. And we can see the nice little, straight away, we see the decay in scheduling, which you'd expect. But is it okay that we've still got a third of our time not committed next week? Is that all right? And it might be, but, you know, worth, worth asking the question. So if we wanted to look at the week after next, which is a time when we might be able to um, begin to influence, let's just bring it down to Gold Coast University Hospital. What I can now do, this is every session that we've got up in our theatres now visible according to the number of minutes that are available and the number of minutes that are already booked. So same as the aggregated, but now disaggregated down to individual session. And what's quite cool here is that I can go into uh, any one of these now and click into it itself and it'll tell me my doctors and it'll tell me my uh, uh, total minutes available and the operation length estimates and then how much time I've still got in the session as an actual management device now for a fortnight's time. So this is in the booking office now, and this is typically up on the screen. And this, uh, this is, that's pretty cool, but it's not the coolest stuff. The really cool stuff is up here, because now I can say, okay, well, we know that each theatre session is owned, owned, allocated to a surgeon, right? And that surgeon's got a waiting list. So can we concatenate the waiting list at the back of the session? Can we then calculate the amount of remaining minutes and then select from the waiting list those patients that you might want to book in whose estimated minutes will fit into the session? And it turns out we can. That's an algorithmic operation. It's repeatable and it's generalizable. So I can show all of my booking options here for this surgeon, for this session, for this list as of this morning. And there they are, because they're all the patients that will fit in. But I can also show me long wait booking options to say, are there any patients who, if we don't get them in in the next four weeks, are at risk of breaching? So I go in in the morning now. If I'm the ENT coordinator, I can click my ENT button. There's my doctors. Here's all my sessions that are up for the next six weeks. Here's one that's not used very much. Click on that. There's the patient that I need to make the first offer to because the minutes will probably fit in. And um, it's so cool because the clinical directors then go, well, how are you using the minute calculation? And we're going, great question. And, then we, and, then, and now we're beginning to develop this little algorithm set that takes to them their minimum maximum average of the last two years procedures that they actually did. And we say, do you want to name a point on there that you'd be comfortable with that we can use as an estimate? And once they've done that, of course, we're in, we're in business because they've told us what the variation, and then the last thing we need to do, and again, we've not done this yet, but we've got the kit to do it. The last thing we're gonna do is allow them to assign variations when they're listing or when they're putting patients up for scheduling. So this is likely to be, I know I've got my mean here, but this is likely to be plus 20%, plus 40%, so I'll allow for it, and they know. And, um, but they haven't got the mechanisms to bring all of that together in terms of a capacity and demand analysis operationally to be able to make the best decisions we can make today. So that's pretty cool, and we're, I'm really, really excited by that because that, I'll talk about that. I'll talk about the extensions of what we now know and what we might now be able to imagine doing for the first time, now that we know that we can do this kind of stuff, which itself is really quite interesting. Um, so I'm going to get out of that. Is that, is that really cool? Oh, that's really cool. You've got to admit, that's pretty cool. I think it is. Uh, okay. Any of you? in this room, there might be some who've tried to sort out surgical waiting lists. I think we'll appreciate this more than those of you who haven't, right? But I spent years of my life wondering, often if you've got like, sometimes 38 hospitals in a national network, and you're thinking, I've got, I've got a waiting list problem over there, and it's not going away, and I can see it's in those three teams, what's going on? And you just don't know, and they don't know, and they know you know they don't know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it's really hard, and then you've just got to get in a big consultancy house for $150,000, and they tell you something once, but by the time they've delivered the reports and it's validating, <laughs> you take it back to the surgeon, and go, oh yeah, well that was three months ago, but it's all changed, oh! <laughs> and you can't answer then, and it's really hard to get the thing off the ground. Anyway, I'll, I'll move on. So that's, the, so that's the schedule monitor, again. So this is a cheeky bit of maths that we did in terms of elective allocation. So if we're thinking about productivity and effectiveness, theatres are a big thing for us. They're about 12% of our total resource, and uh, it's obviously where a lot of the risk is in terms of making sure we've got uh, 
making sure we've got the right things happening. But one of the big, I'm not going to go into all of this, don't worry, but one of the big things is about have we, have we got the right number of theatre sessions allocated to teams according to the actual presenting demand on the list at the moment, right? And uh, again, this, this feels like a potentially algorithmic uh, issue. So what we did was we took the waiting lists and did time bank, time bank calculations on them every day, which we run at the back. And we basically sum for each surgeon, for each level of urgency, how many minutes they need to treat the patients on the list. And we just look at that every day, runs in the background. And then it's not a, it's not a, it's not a huge leap of imagination then to say, well, can we take all of those minutes and set them against the minutes that we've actually allocated to the surgeon in the next period of time and see if they match? Because if there's not enough minutes in theatre to treat the patients on the list, we're not going to be able to treat the patients on the list and we need to allocate more theatres. So we did that and this is what it looked like. And then we tried to do it intuitive and blah, blah, blah. So this is updated every day. And uh, when we first show this, uh, the surgeons go, aha, told you so. Because, you know, this is the number of minutes available against the number of minutes that we need. And then we go, yeah, but the problem for you is that this is the number of minutes we need and this is the number of minutes available. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? And uh, we've never seen that before. And yeah, I think this is, this is very controversial, by the way. We're, 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 we're doing this. This is very live at the moment. Um, but it's working. I'll show, you, I'll show you why it's working. So again, we're just uh, thinking about this validation thing. So our, our good friends, orthopedics, doesn't matter. We can select any of them. If I then scroll down here, this is the total number of um, sessions that we've got allocated. And this is the total number of implied sessions we need, given the state of the waiting list this morning over the next 26 weeks. So this is the future profile of demand against capacity in theatres by specialty. But what's quite cool about it is that we can drop down another level Oh, let me just select just one facility, otherwise we, uh, otherwise it gets a bit noisy. There we go, that's better. We can look at each of the members of the team and we can say, for you, have you got enough theatre sessions for the amount of demand in minutes that's on your waiting list according to the list of decisions you've made in outpatients? And for some of them on the face of it, it looks like there's a, there's a, a surfeit, you know, this looks like a bit too much. So when we drill into the individual doctors now, we can look at the next 26 weeks for the doctors and we can see some weeks, it looks like we might, we're at risk of overruns, but for many weeks, it looks like we've got enough capacity. But again, in terms of the validation, we can go click, 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 and we can say, are these the uh, allocated theatre session booking details for you in the next um, four weeks? Do you recognise these patients that are in your slots? And are these the sessions that you've got allocated to you? So do you have all day on Tuesday? And if the answer comes back no, we've got to go and sort our mapping out because it's a data quality problem, but we know about it there and then. And once we've sorted it out, we can redo the calc automatically and come back and say, how about that? So we can go click, 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 and we can say the information system that you're in the organisation that you're a part of has got recorded in it that these are the sessions that we've allocated to you. Oh, is that right? Same way as the outpatient. So we're starting to begin the conversation just to get transparent what the actual resource allocation is in terms of the databases as of now. And if that's wrong, we need to fix that. We need to fix that before we do anything else because everything's going to be out. You multiply that by 51 sites and, you know, two and a half thousand surgeons and then 20 years of neglect. What's the odds that that data right at the core is appropriately mapped to each individual doctor? It's astronomically unlikely, isn't it, that will have happened by accident. And that's why one of the great functions of the system, going back to that data quality thing, is about frequency and transparency, driving the data quality improvement. Because now we want to know. Because it looks like we might be starting to make decisions on the basis of this. So I definitely want you to be right about the number of theatre sessions you've allocated to me. So it's visceral now, it's not theoretical. So I think that's really cool. So that's capacity and demand analysis for theatres at doctor level, bringing the time bank on the waiting list alongside the time allocation from the theatre sessions automated every day in time period. So now we're having a different conversation. Is that cool too? I'm looking for validation here. <laughs> uh, Utilisation is another one of our favourite things. Just before we move on to that, we can, we're trying to do this triangulation. In my mind's eye, we're not quite there yet, but I'm just showing you two of what I think are going to be four coefficients which are going to be able to absolutely, definitively, once and for all, industry standard, determine whether or not we're doing chronological management effectively. One of them is the uh, nominal waitlist maximum I showed you before. So if I've got a doctor with a, very l with a light order book and breaches, I've got a targeting problem. Almost certainly, but I can't prove that beyond reasonable doubt. But if I look at the elective surgery waiting times of the patients who've actually been treated in time period, and again, these are forms of standard analysis that we've all seen in different ways, I can then um, 
let me just simplify this a little bit by just selecting our main place. So I can look at this ophthalmology, and then this is each of my doctors in ophthalmology. And what we've got here is the patients who they've, who they've treated in the last period of time according to the quarter um, percentiles of time. So this is the maximum we've got. That'll be uh, 30 days to treat my Category 1 patients. So this doctor here, their longest waiting patient was 28 days, but their 50th percentile of treatment was 7 days. This is really interesting, actually, because what it says is that we've got a practice here which is targeting the immediate listing of patients coming out of outpatients and into next week's theatres. Now, that might be okay, but if you've got um, specialties like orthopaedics, for example, they've got a preponderance of Category 3s and we've got a significant amount of time to treat them, and we see distributions like, uh, like this, then we're now exposing the variation. Let me just move to Category 3s. Sorry about that. GCUH, Category 3, orthopaedics, wait time, yeah. So this is each of our surgeons over the last 12 months of treatments. And we've got some of our doctors who are, their mean time is about in the middle of the time spread available and they're pushing the maximums for the longest waiting patient that they actually treated. And then we've got some of our doctors here who've got incredibly short mean waiting times. And if they're the same doctors that have got light order books and the same doctors that aren't doing very many, very many new slots in outpatients, now we've got a conversation. Because actually, one narrative here is that we've got a situation where people are running their public practice like private practice and seeing and listing and seeing and listing and seeing and listing, which is fine as long as we've sorted out all of our undifferentiated demand at the front door and the team as a whole is doing the right amount of outpatients to theatre capacity to manage the population need because we want to calculate the overall number of surgeons we need to manage the ageing population with a growing burden of disease. But we can't do that if, if we've got this level of variation about treating and listing and time practice it's not even consistent when we've got people doing the same range of operations. So we're in a new world about the conversations we're having, but we've got to be professionally respectful. No one's ever done this stuff before in terms of this level of personal granularity. So we're not saying anyone's done anything wrong at the outset. No one's ever challenged these practices at this level before. So in terms of custom and practice and fairness, you can't suddenly say that's wrong and that's right. All we can do at this stage is begin to hold up the mirror and say, is this okay? And what might explain it, and what range of actions can we begin to uh, imagine to, uh, to intervene if we think it's appropriate? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, so, that's, so that's kind of the triangulation of the chronological management. And then just do one more, which is, I think is really cool. There's a real, there's a real, there's a real nice punchline here, and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, so, th so these are the kinds of charts we see in annual reports, where we say, oh, we've got a utilisation rate of 78% or whatever it is. And this is our distribution across all of our specialties. Uh, again, let me just, I think the room's getting a little bit restless, so I'm gonna try and go a little bit more quickly, because um, we, could, we could be here all day. Uh, so Martin, the theatre utilisation, is it all unscheduled? No. Uh, all scheduled. Yeah, this is scheduled, yeah. The emergencies are off to the side, so this is just the ones that are set aside for electives. You'll have seen a button earlier on about the amount of emergency cases that hit the elective yeah. thing. And that's, that's, uh, that's, again, a story that we hear a lot, but it's often only 5 or 10% of the demand. So, again, that's another case of confirmation bias. And you can see why, if you're a surgeon and you had an emergency case and you got something that you really wanted to do cancelled, you'd be absolutely livid. And, and we, we do get very livid about that, and rightly so. But then we remember that moment for weeks, and it becomes a feature of the system. But, in fact, it doesn't happen that often. And we can now demonstrate how often it happens. And sometimes it does, and there's things that we need to do in terms of... Um, in terms of how we organise scheduling. So let's get into one of our uh, specialties, doesn't matter which one. So this is utilisation. Well, this is now utilisation by doctor in the specialty. And this now gets quite interesting because we've got an interesting uh, several variation. And this is every theatre session you did for the last 26 weeks. I think this is so cool. Because now what I'm saying is for this doctor in this specialty over this time period, Here's the number of uh, patients that we saw, and this is the amount of time that we had free in the session. And now what I can do is I can click into any one of the sessions, including the ones from last week, and it will show me the track of what went on. And uh, what we've got is the, let me just move a little bit to the left. What we've got here is the summary of the session overall. That's a bit garbled. There should, just, there should only be one of those. I knew there was going to be a glitch sooner or later. But when it, when it, when it looks nice, that's going to annoy me. I'll see if I can come out and go into another one and see if it's general or just with that one. Sorry about this, everybody. That's better. I think this is going to be better. 
yeah, that's better. That's what it should look like. I don't know. I can't explain that previous one. But basically, what we what this tells us, this is a summary of what actually happened, where this is where the patients were in knife to skin in that session as of last week, which is a session you did, right? And if it's not, we need to start the mapping. And this is what we booked to happen. So this is the difference between the scheduling and the reality. So we're starting to have the conversation about the effectiveness of the scheduling and the likelihood of churn. And this is the summary of the anaesthetic session of when the patient was under and when they weren't. And now we start to have a very interesting conversation about the relative contribution of different members of the team towards the effectiveness of the service overall. And it drives very interesting issues about rosters and about whether we should have subspecialised anaesthetists and all that kind of thing. But the transparency here takes us all the way down into the individual patients now so we can review our sessions in terms of early starts, late finishes and all of the dimensions of utilisation including the patients who went through last week um, automatically by surgeon. So that's, uh, again, a whole, a whole new conversation in terms of effectiveness. Whew. You can see the general form of what we're trying to achieve here. I'm kind of, I've gone in two minds now because my sense about the room is... Oh, and, yeah. Yeah, let's interrupt. Let's do questions. Yeah. Um, the first one was, who, who uses this system? Who, um, who uses it? So what type of personnel? Uh, is it so at the, at the present level of maturity, it's deployed in our outpatient scheduling office, it's employed in our clinical care coordinators and our theatre booking offices. Our improvement teams use it, our demand and flow teams use it, and my innovations team use it for specials, because we're doing a lot of discovery at the moment about the uh, impact of the data on the teams. So there's a lot of, a lot of that going on. And uh, the senior clinical directors, there's a distribution of those about the set which are really engaged. There's us and use it directly. And we can see the utilisation, which is very interesting. And those that enjoy it, but don't really want to log on themselves. And, and that's driving my thinking quite hard. So if you don't mind, what, what lay behind the question? Oh, um, uh, in my previous roles, I've worked in DHBs. And one of my frustrations has always been, I'm a nurse by trade, but I've uh, been in sort of senior positions and things. One of my... Um, Challenges, frustrations has been the in, the multiple data sources yep. and the gatekeepers for all those data sources. And I remember talking to my IT department about I don't know ten or fifteen years ago and said I want a portal that I can just go in and query what I want to look at, so that I don't have to keep going back and forward between you and somebody else and saying that wasn't quite what I was wanting. Can you get me this? Yeah. So just to eliminate the problem you were describing earlier. Yeah, and that's exactly what our ambition is: is to yeah. build that generalizable portal. Because I think if we sat. 300 nurses in a room doing the job you were doing 15 years ago we'd have a 90 percent consistency on what people needed but we haven't got a delivery system at the moment that's standard to the industry to enable us to do that level of learning what i'm interested in is some common and this is this is two to five years from now if we keep going is uh, is some socio adaptive technology that enables every hospital because the point about the, the transferable change doesn't work right every hospital has got to come to know its own situation and then navigate its own path of improvement because we've got these natural histories capabilities appetites of risk and cultures and antagonism and conflict let's be honest this is, this is a reality so i'm interested in whether we're at, we're, at, we're at a point of convergence of visualization and sql and server power and automation techniques which is where we're sort of doing some pioneering work at the moment, but Christchurch as well, done a lot of this stuff, is about whether or not there's a, we can begin to glimpse a next generation product that would say you don't have to click on. What we need to do is just give me a simple natural language set of rules about what you want to try and achieve, and then we'll tell you. You know, we'll bring it to you. So the concept of analytics as being something happening here that people access, I think itself needs to be... So what I want to do is get this up to a point where it's absolutely fantastic compared to what's here in the industry as a whole, and then disrupt that. Because actually the next thing is about saying, let's just have a basically a brain inside the hospital where all of the decision makers become a neural network themselves. And by their own appetites for risk and sensibility, drive a set of notifications that means the awareness of the hospital of itself just moves to a completely different level. And I think we're on the edges of the ability to do that. And I'll, I'll just show one slide at the end about, uh, about a, a parallel technology, uh, which is leading the way. So, so the, uh, you're right, and you, and you keyed in exactly to the argument I'm doing. Having done all of this work, I'm now sort of conceptually leaving it behind. So I'm thinking, yeah, that's really, and it is really good, and it gives us great performance gains, and it's better. But it's not where we want to be. Now, what we really want to be is over here, where the thing's just doing itself, and then telling us the human actions we need to take, because our pattern recognition isn't strong enough. Yeah. Um, patients are often not aware yep. of the Yes. Yes. What the hospital needs to know and what does that mean a hospital knowing something what a cool idea 
and I think I think we might be at the beginnings of that. But um, what's really interesting, and I don't I don't know if the colleagues from Christchurch have been thinking about this as well. Once you've done the automation and you've set it up, it's untouched by human hand at high frequency, patient level and patient identifiable. You're creating an environment within which all of that work can begin. So I don't know if any of you, has anybody here followed Test Cricket? Mm -hmm. Me. So you know the Duckworth Lewis method. So does that mean anything to anybody? Anyway, so if you, have a, if you have a test match and it rains, you have to decide who won, even though it rained or whether it was a draw, right? So, so this is relevant, honest. Um, the, the International Cricket Council has adopted this Duckworth-Lewis method, which basically takes all the statistics associated with the key resources a team's got to win, which is basically the number of overs left and the number of batters that still aren't out. And it does a calculation on that, and it says, here's the winner. And they've, they've, they've actually adopted this method to statistically determine who wins a test match when it rains. And they announce victory by Duckworth-Lewis method. India beat Australia, whatever. Anyway, it's now the Duckworth-Lewis-Stern method because Steve Stearns inherited because uh, Duckworth and Lewis have retired. So Stearns come in and uh, he's now is the holder and he's, he's, he's updated it, made it a bit smarter. Uh, he's a big cricket fan. I know him, which is the point of the story. And uh, so we met Steve Stern and we showed him the stuff. He actually works in Bond University. He's just a fluke, which is like 10 minutes away from my house. And uh, we heard about him on the network. And I went to see him and I said, and he went, it's oh, fantastic. He said, what couldn't I do with that? So we've got this grant in. Right. And so he's got this world-class statistician. He's a brilliant guy and a lovely bloke as well. And he, what he saw when he saw this stuff wasn't the stuff. What he saw was the opportunity to develop um, intellectually secure, mathematically reliable statistical modelling that will give us proper embedded predictive analysis. So the stuff you're talking about, those tools are there. They're, again, they're down payments on where we need to be because the actual process of statistics itself has moved on. And the market that we're working in isn't up to the edge of where it could be, I think, to get value out of this at scale. So, so I think there's a combination of really great stats, predictive analytics, some AI stuff, a bit sceptical about that, but then this, uh, this active socio-adaptive technology, which I think will be the, you know, the, the predecessor but one from this kind of thing. So this is V1 for me, and it's about proof of concepts about can we do this kind of thing. Um, what about people's side of it? Um, uh, just about every single um, hospital district health board in the country is moving towards purchasing these kinds of tools. Or as um, in the case of Canterbury, hit them for a few years. Um, but the way I'm sort of treating it in the purchases we're going through is this, to make the information side of it kind of, or the, the argument that um, we haven't got good data or good information go away so that we're starting to look at the change practices that are done. But one of the issues, even when I went into one committee, because I think committees should be using this stuff, um, is they say, well, we can't read graphs. We don't know what that graph means. So there's quite a lot of um, people side to it, addressing that, addressing that, addressing that. Yeah, I was talking to a couple of colleagues at lunch, when they, uh, at the coffee break, and they were talking about, you know, issue in pivot tables and saying this is real easy, just use the pivot and you can see whatever you like. And I was saying, yeah, but no one knows how to do a pivot table, which we, which we all laughed at and agreed with. And it's true. And, and that's, I think, why I'm, I'm increasingly sceptical that we need to stop here, because I think that we need to begin learning to serve out information in these very small packets that's highly targeted to people that isn't really in graph form. I think the graph's had its day. That whole idea of the Cartesian axis requires a level of background numeracy that we, we often don't find, if we're brutally honest, we often don't find that broadly distributed, even in professional populations, people are uncomfortable with it as a language. But also it's not necessary. It's necessary to drive a predictive logic that says we might be getting into trouble, but it's not necessarily to guide the action. And what we've found most times is what people actually want to know is, yeah, 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 but which patients do I need to target in order to bring this thing back into line? Or if I want to achieve that, what is that I need to do today? And that doesn't need a graph. That tends to need a list of patients with a set of characteristics that enables them to go and make a phone call or look at a medical record. And so that's where, that's why, that's exactly the reason why in our stuff, it's click, 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 here's, here's the cohort. So what we're about in this stage of our technology is saying generalized business logic, anticipatory, click, click, is the sub cohort associated with all of these risks that sit on top of it. And that's what you could do today to improve it. And this is a, this is a great, we found it really, we found it really good. We found it very, very positive. And it hasn't been, uh, it's, it's putting us on a journey, but actually we're, it's, we're moving up a maturity curve on it because the conversation's better. Is that said, are you, partly that's um, operationalising the data so someone can act on it, so that's that actual insight. Absolutely. Yeah. Then there's the, the I mean, um, 
there's just the conversation stuff you talked about, which is actually stepping back and having a look. And you know, those sorts of uh, skills are pretty rare, to be frank. I think that a lot of people don't probably, you know, either know how to have those conversations or even help people understand what the data is actually saying. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's chicken and an egg, isn't it? Yeah, if you haven't got automatic great data that's telling us stories that we know is going to be there every day, yeah. what's my incentive to start? Because it's very hard with the request and respond model. How do you even get it off the ground? It's really difficult. And going back to the earlier slide about stories and relationships and trust, Bob, which is actually what we're doing, I can strongly agree with you. The journey starts when we've got really great automated data under a really solid business logic, talking to doctors about their practice and blah, blah, blah. That's when we begin. I think, and it's where we begin actually something quite new, and it's a new chapter. So whilst those, those skills aren't available now, I'm not surprised they're not available, because we make it almost impossible, even for our best leaders, to do data-led change in a way that's going to embed into their reliable, reliably into their relationships. It's almost impossible. And again, as, a, as an industry of public health, what are the odds of us reinventing the correct strategy 400 times in the next five years? It's a pretty unlikely, isn't it? So we're, we're going to have to start collaborating to sort it out. I think it comes back to that R in your equation of the relevance yes. and, the, you know, and, and how you present that information relevantly to the, you know, to the different areas in there. I'm really excited by animated data. I'm really excited about that because I think that's going to take us on. You know, no more charts. You know, stick the goggles on and you can walk through what happened last week. You know, and uh, little avatars. Of no, that's too much. But it's not, is it? I mean, that's, that's where we're going to go. What happened last Tuesday? Oh, there's Mrs. Smith. How are you? Hello. Ghostly hologram. <laughs> You're discharged. No. So if you're clicking through to find out the information and you find, you know, here's a period of time that could be used more productively, yep. here's the people that could go into it, yep. why wouldn't that be an automated analysis of, you know, it goes out to the CD, the surgeon, the nurse unit manager that says, hey everyone, next Tuesday, this is an opportunity. What What's the... Do you want a job? No, but the point, I mean, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I was talking about the socio-adaptive technology. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because this actually, you know, I mean, you still need to have conversations. Yep. So like right now, you can click, 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 and you can go and have a conversation with that CD or that surgeon and say, hey, we could do this. What right. do you think? So what do you actually do with that information now? Who has that conversation? It do depends, right? So, so just one direct example, looking at that ENT example, it's in our clinical care coordinators. So we've got these offices that do the surgical bookings. So they will say, and again, click, click, I can see the cohort here, and I'm not, I've not got enough operating time in that week, so I'll literally contact those three patients and book them two weeks ahead. So that's how it's driving their actions. It changes the order in which they book. So within clinical priority, making sure that we're doing it in order so that no one week spills over the sides of the available capacity. That's just one example. The one in the outpatients is different because we can select the cohort that we're going to send out the offers to book in and then target the phone calls into the particular slots that we need because we want to maximise our utilisation. With our clinical directors, it's like, oh, we seem to have eight uh, physicians here, two of which are on the extreme end of our utilisation curve. Do we need a conversation? How did that bit go? You're really pulling this out of me now. <laughs> but I'll tell you the story, because it doesn't matter, because I can do it at a level of generality that means everybody's safe. Imagine a world where we had this kind of data, and imagine a team in which there's a doctor who's maybe doing two news and two reviews in a four-hour clinic, right? And because no one's ever really looked at it like that, it's not become an issue. So we've got, we're really, really serious about this professionally respectful culture. So it's not my job to talk to that doctor. It wouldn't be appropriate. But the clinical director's job, he sits down. And in the first session, we have a lot of denial. And a lot of the seminar is not really real. And it's, oh, yeah, it kind of is, you know. So uh, these are the patients. And did you see them? And if you're saying that's not right, what other patients did you see that aren't in the system? Because have we got a big clinical governance problem that you're seeing patients that aren't even in the system? So we go through all of that and we come out the other side and yeah, it is actually, I'm doing two news and two reviews. And uh, well, why is that template set up like that? And the reason is this guy's lost his confidence, right? So he said, actually, I'm anxious. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. I need a very long time to sit down with patients and I want to, um, uh, you know, I'm, it, I, th I think the line was, I, j I joined the hospital when it was a small hospital and now it's a very big hospital and there's a lot more demand and a lot more risk in here. And, you know, I'm, I'm troubled by my own capability to manage what comes in the door. And I think that's a beautiful conversation because now we're in the right place. Now we're starting to talk about how we can give meaning to work. Now we're addressing a real risk that could never have been arrived at in any other way. And we've got through some boundaries of defensiveness. And we're now we've got to have a conversation about development or management or let's be honest, just compensation because maybe that's okay. 
Other examples where we look at the variation in referrals rating from general practice and we find uh, some general practices have got very high referrals in for scopes, for example. But if you're a GP who missed a bowel cancer in a 32-year-old mother of three and thought it was indigestion, what are you going to do? You're going to say stop practicing. You're going to say oh, it's okay. You're going to refer more scopes. I would, because you know you just as, and and they, they, these are real. You know this is why the professional respect thing is really important. So, so yes, the data and yes, the stories. But it's all about this atmosphere of trust and then doing it in the appropriate way. And that's why I I, I don't have talked about it this morning. But this new public management thing, like, it's just a curse. It's an absolute curse on public services, you know, and we've got to get rid of it. That whole, it's not about commercial disciplines. And the secrets of productivity in public health care is not going to be about top-down performance management. It just doesn't work. And, I suppose that's one and of the it creates tension and anxiety and conflict. We've just got to stop. Well, we've got to do something else. And one of the challenges of having things automated and you could do this and you could do that is it takes the human aspect out of it. It takes the opportunity to have that conversation with that person that says, actually, I am anxious and, you know... Yeah, but hold we that did thought. We practice like this, and now we need to practice like this, and I, I'm not ready for that, or I need more admin support, or whatever. So it does take that out of it. Yeah, it does. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'm happy to go in. I've got some really cool ED stuff and some cool bed platform stuff, but you've, you've seen enough to think. But I'm happy to do it if people want to. But this is our rise in demand and our reduction in the waiting list. We're down to about, this was about to about 8,000 in terms of people who waited too long. We finished this performance year in about 4,700. That's over about a three year period. Um, this is our elective surgery performance. Uh, the way this works is uh, what's the percentage of patients who are treated in time in a time period? And that was kind of the, that was the story of the bounce we got. It takes a while to introduce these things and embed them, but then once they're in with this kind of thing, it becomes sustainable. That's pretty cool. Um, our ED access performance against presentations and our sort of four hour target thing. I think you've got six hours here, haven't you? Um, and this is some of the clinical team stuff that we do. This is our cardiology clinical measurement. I showed you some of the uh, unscheduled care requests things and the variation in that. And we had, uh, we had some really, and again, because these things often aren't reported up centrally, they become hidden reservoirs of clinical risk, actually. You know, I've got unreported ECGs or I've got people who needed ECGs that were discharged, come back, never got you back because we got busy, blah, blah, blah. And so we can, uh, we can, um, we can get rid of those. And then, and then these are just the typical sort of, um, sort of stories about lists that get out of control and then come back into control and we can get down uh, across surgical and medical areas. Um, and this talks to your point, so this is, me, this is my last slide, so we can kind of take the session wherever we like or stop it. This is the um, National Health Transport Safety Authority in the United States and this is their um, framework for automated cars which is a big deal at the moment and if any, if any of you haven't done it yet I'd strongly recommend that you google Tony Seba S-E-B-A um, and read it he gave a talk in Australia about two or three months ago he's a Stanford based associate professor and he's an ex-entrepreneur and he's really into solar power and disruptive technologies and he's got this 55 minute talk on there about uh, clean energy and transport uh, disruption and he talks a lot about autonomous cars. Fantastic presentation. It's one of those TED talks. It's brilliant. Um, anyway, so so this is this is the this is national public uh, published version now about so so on at level naught you've got a driver must constantly monitor and do the car and there's not very much support. On level one the driver's still got to constantly monitor but's got and has got to be ready to resume full control immediately. So that's kind of the equivalent of the autopilot function that you'd have in most uh, larger aeroplanes. And then level two is when you've got sufficient automation for the driver able to monitor the drive and ready to resume control, but the system's starting to take over both steering and acceleration and deceleration. So I got a new Honda Civic, which is a really cool car, and it's got that adaptive cruise control, little radar system. So you can put 100 kilometers and set off onto Brisbane, and you can say, do I want to be one, two, three, or four car lengths away from the car in front of me? And you put three in, and it's got a lane keeping and assist, and just for laughs, you can take your hands off the wheel and it'll slowly adjust into the lanes and it'll keep you a certain distance away from the car in front. Like it'll slow you down and speed you up, so it does braking and deceleration. So my Honda is here at the moment, and I think it's really cool. It just gives me kind of a childhood joy, you know. Uh, so, so level three is where the system takes over steering, acceleration, deceleration, and capable of recognising limits and notifying the driver. That's interesting, isn't it? So now we've got a more positive awareness of the machine in this kind of socio-adaptive sense. Level four is where the driver can hand over the entire driving task in, in a defined use case. 
So they've done this, uh, the, uh, it was either Elon Musk or one of the Google or Apple ones, they did this like, some, like a 600 mile drive with a big truck and they had all kinds of safety apparatus and police transports around it. But what they basically said is we think we're at the point now where we can take a big articulated lorry and as long as the driver can drive it onto the freeway, we can get it point to point on the freeway. They can't quite get the driving enough to do the country roads and the stop signs in the village. But once you're on the motorway, you can get there and stay there and it can be safe. And they've done it over about 600 miles and they, and it, and they pulled it off. But that's a defined use case because the technology is, is still limited. And then the level five is a system can take over the dyna entire dynamic driving task in all use cases. So basically the driver here is no longer required at all. So this is the future and probably in our lifetimes is where you'll call your Uber and it'll turn up and there won't be anybody in it. And you'll get in the back and it'll take you somewhere and then you'll get out again and there won't be anybody there. And, um, and then all the taxi drivers who used to have the licenses will go to the Uber drivers. Yeah, you see, you got yours. Because <laughs> disruption's going to come for us all and automation will come for many of us. So, so this full automation thing, I think this is really, really interesting. This concept of beginning progressively regulating the level of automation that a technology can deliver at a point in time. There's a lot of problems to solve in here. There's a lot of problems to solve in hospitals, but this is to your, the point you were making before. I think there, are, there is going to be a lot of uh, stuff that we're going to have to reserve to clinical judgment, but can we imagine a world, answer is yes, where I get a referral in and I've got one clinical moment that I need and I can't see how we get over this, although with structured data we'll be able to in the end, that says give me the urgency of the referral and I think everything else is automated. So I can send out the letter automatically, there's no, no work in that. And I'll need a call centre for changed bookings still. But even then we can give people unique booking reference numbers they can go from home. So basically I can optimise the slot selection. I can say that clinic's the right one for you, here's your substream, come in, you can either come in that Tuesday, that Thursday or the next week, book your thing online and you're good. So I think there's a whole, and that will be better than the system we've got now for everybody except the clinic administrators. And uh, we'll have to think about work um, and how that, how that goes in the future. But I think there's a whole range of things that we do which we can improve and reduce the cost of by automation. The point is for our industry, we've got to do the pre-work before any of this becomes possible in terms of the relationships and the governance and the trust in order to get the soft information out we need to develop these generalizable technologies that can then uh, produce an autonomous hospital that's conscious of its own demands and conscious of its own capacity and able to make um, pretty much real-time decisions and then get some of them checked for human oversight. I don't think that's inconceivable from where we are now, but we're five to ten years away. But the time's going to pass anyway, right? What else are we going to do? We're going to scrabble around with request and respond analytics. It's a waste of time. Anyway. So what about cost counting? Oh, shit. The system you've got now on are you building it up? Um, across 50 hospitals, we've got a budget of about two million a year, something like that. But that's, um, but that's excluding licences. Queens and Health bought a load of click licences. Apart from that, we use standard technologies, but we program it all ourselves. So, uh, so a lot of the stuff is just built in house. So it's highly, it's highly cost effective. Oh, this sorry, is a. If anybody needs to go to the bathroom, that's going to really tip you over the edge. <laughs> how, how big of a team have you got in terms of analysts and so on that have produced all of this stuff? So we started off with consultants, but as we know, uh, that burn was just too great. So we, we actually did. A, we actually went out to the universities locally and took a set of new grads in and trained them up. So they do a lot of the click stuff. So we've got a team of four grads. We've got one senior developer, Chris Ogg, who's my associate professor, he's a fantastic guy. He's a PhD geneticist, but he's totally into his system stuff and he's got a bit of consulting and programming history as well. And then I've got uh, an MBA young woman, Kate, who's such a dynamo and she does a lot of the relational stuff with the teams and she's, she's an OT by background and is just absolutely full of energy. So, she, so, so between the, it's the three of us essentially from a leadership point of view. So I, I've, got, I've got the nonsense and Chris does a lot of the programming with his team and then Kate does a lot of the engagement stuff and I do, I do some work, I do a lot of design work and then a lot of work with the engagements as well. Um, let me think, then we've got a platform and integration team, it's probably got about six people in it, four to six people in it depending. And then we've got a business networking team which is a lot of the hospital relationships, probably got another four people, so 15 all up maybe. But that's for the statewide programme and that's what the two million goes on. So. 50, five zero, yeah, yeah. Because the costs are zero, right? The costs are approaching zero. Once you've, once you've done it, 
if you've got your if you've got your dev test and prod in place, then you can get it through all of your quality channels. By the time it's in production, you've got all your data flows resolved. It's a zero cost. In, in a, is your team sort of does it remain heavily involved in the conversation with the clinical team, or are they gradually able to? <laughs> uh, nothing gradual. Are they, are they picking it up and running nah. it themselves, or do you still have to stay? We could, we could stop, right? Because I think what we've done is cool. And by common that knowledge, we won, a, we won the People's Award at the Queensland the Health gig. I didn't go because I was a bit embarrassed by those things. Um, but we got the Innovation and the People's Award a couple of months ago. So I think the team's quite well regarded because we, um, we do this relational stuff quite well because we, we believe it and we mean it. Um, and the professional respectful stuff. So we could stop and pack up and say that was a really nice piece of work, well done. But that's only if we think we're at the end of what we're doing. But if we think we're absolutely at the beginning of what we're doing, then uh, why would we? So actually what we're, what we're thinking about now is how do we create the conditions to build the next, completely the next version, or complete rebuild. Because this is done in click and SQL, which is fine. But getting push notifications and all that social adaptive stuff out, that's hard. So I'm thinking about what team would we need to actually code it properly and build all of that statistical stuff in with Steve Stern and the socio-adaptive stuff in and some of that predictive stuff in and then you can just glimpse something and then start doing some of the automation on the slots. Even you just do that once for one clinic and you could almost say like that, let's do it for two weeks and see what happens, you know, because we can actually watch all of the events and then slowly build up confidence in that. And that's five or ten years, you know. And then you've got all the ED and the bad platform and the theatres. Somebody mentioned ICU, we just started on ICU soon as well. That's going to be really interesting. And, I'm, and my, one of my interests is, is there an environment in the hospital? The other thing is that the overview, the whole system. I was talking with Trish the other day about quality improvement and the positive, negative, possible negative effects of doing small projects. When we begin conceptualising hospitals as whole systems, one of my questions intellectually is, is there will be environments in which the method doesn't work and we're going to have to reconceptualise what information and situation analysis looks like for different teams. We haven't found one yet, but a lot of this is hard work. We, I think there's about 37 teams that every big hospital needs from different from support and infrastructure and clinical teams, verticals and horizontals. If we can master the environments and all of those 37s and then apply the new AI and stat stuff, I think we'll start to get into a real interesting place. So, so yes, kind of, but it's, it's more of a phase shift for us now because we're thinking about how do we pull a different future forward, having, having cut our teeth on some of this stuff. One more thing. Um, the software you're using. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, not completely happy, or is, is, um, is it going to do what you need to, need uh, to I think we're I think we're at the edges of what we can do with Click. I think we've pushed it quite hard to get to where we are, and we've yeah. bent it a little bit out of shape, and we've done a lot of work on it. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like the product very much, personally. The reason we're using it is because Queensland Health bought an enterprise-wide licence for it. So when I was doing my business case two and a half years ago, I got my business logic, which is entirely conceptual, that's just mental effort. I got my data management, which is just absolutely standard Microsoft stack, nothing, nothing, nothing you'd be surprised in there. And then when it came to visualization, well, everyone's already got that. So we ain't funding that. We ain't funding anything else other than click. So that was a constraint for me. So everything we did, we had to do in click, that's okay. You just accept your constraints. Constraints are the mother of invention. So everything we've done, we've done in click. I, I don't like it, I think it's ugly. I don't like its colour scheme, I don't like its palettes, I don't like its objects. I, I hate it, and I've come to hate it with a passion. So when, when I do these demos, this is why I'm saying, do you think this looks all right? Because I think that's but ugly, you know. And I, but of course, I've lived with it, I, and uh, familiarity breeds contempt, doesn't it? So, uh, I, yeah, I, I really don't like Click. But I, and I, I think that whole Click Tableau thing, that's, that's going to be... That's, if you, there's, a, there's a great Gartmore analysis out about six months ago that went through the whole BI space, big, big free, free to air. Um, they did a whole analysis of every vendor in this space, and obviously, Click and Tableau got the biggest market share. But one of the one of the hidden comments in the uh, industry commentary at the bottom of the Gartmore was that they, the the most likely uh, location of competition is in the industry specific analytic frameworks that solve business problems. So that idea about an enterprise wide visualization license, I think that's going to be quaint in even three years time, five years time. So I think that I think they're having their moment in the sun. But I don't I don't see coming out of that you know a real forward move. I think every industry now is going to break out and say, right, how do we solve our fundamental problems once and for all? What's our definitive solution at high velocity data with big data? And I think that's where it's going to break out. And I don't see clicking that space. But who knows? I'm sure they've got teams at the moment working on it. 
But in answer to your question, I would, you know, and it's also very difficult to do interactive stuff with Click. So if I were to, so all of those applications you've seen are fixed logic, so no one can adjust them. We don't publish them and say, do what you like. We publish them and say, do this, because that's close to the definitive answer. And then we start a conversation about function uh, development, you know. But what we do not do is publish open applications and say, here, play. We say, click, 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 that's what you need to know. And if it's not what you need to know, let's talk about what you do need to know, and we can talk about that, and we can all learn. But it's not anybody do anything, because then you have two enthusiasts and 100 mystified people that get lost. Because <laughs> how easy is it to get lost? You know, click, where am I? Oh, no, save, don't save, save, oh! Email, can you send it me again? I mean, it's just, so, so we lock it all. We never let it out. And, and we try and do, so we do data spec frequencies, automate it, do a lot of work with the teams to get the definitive analytics, and then we publish. And then we go through the iteration cycle, but at no time is it open to user experiment. Yeah, yeah, they're really different. So, so a big debate for us six months ago was whether we were going to translation to click sense, but we decided not to. Mostly because of my 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 mind is now in what happens next. So I think we're using this just to fully cash out the proof of concept is actually where we are strategically. So we've got a few more environments left to do. Blah blah blah. Our discovery period in terms of the overall edge of what we're doing here is going to stop in probably January to March next year. I don't think we're going to push that much further. In fact, we've got a board meeting for the MIS project in a couple of weeks' time where that's what we're talking about. And I'm thinking about packing up and saying, job well done. But in terms of the innovations that we need, that's phase one. And I think the limitations of click and the limitations of some of the governance that we've got mean I can't get to phase two from where I am. So this is why... So it's like creative destruction, and you've got to set something up and then be sufficiently mindful to go, yeah, I've got to move all away from all of that, forget it completely. What's the, what does the green field tell me we need next? And the technology in this space going so fast. There's visualisation and animation, so much cool stuff. So I think we can knit together something really special that starts to move us towards automation and active monitoring. You know, the brain. I want to start building the rudimentary plastics of the brain and then get each, each hospital leadership, including the clinical leaders predominantly, to interact with it, and those interactions should then get embedded. That's the socio-adaptive stuff, and then you set up a learning environment. And I think I think we're you know we're not, we're not a million miles away. That's that's really really exciting. You know. Can I ask a question? Yeah. I, um, I'm a nurse, and I work with a data system or an acuity system in New Zealand called Trinkia. Called Trinkia. Trinkia. Yep. And I'm just wondering if you've done in. I've noticed a couple of your DHBs there, um, organisations have actual Trinkia in their system. Have you actually done any overlaying of what you've mapped within your clinical environment, so in outpatients and theatre, and done any overlay with the acuity, and did it have any impact on requirements? Yeah, no. Okay. We're just starting, so we've got, three, we've got three new proof of concepts just beginning now. One is an endoscopy with the whole kind of how far up did we go and did we get a rupture and all that kind of stuff. So there's a quality framework there, which is standard. There's a, there's a Socrates in orthopaedics, which we're thinking of doing the integration with, and then in cardiology. So everything I've shown you today is what we might think about the, well, you can think about it in the sense of the bare bones of a enterprise-wide down payment on a future intelligence system, the socio-adaptive thing. So for me, that's one big question, and it is a big question. What you're talking about is the second question, which is a different swim lane, is, is what about the fully fledged version for the clinical team and that and that's got to be this qu these quality measures speak back alongside the access stuff and the rosters mm -hmm. so 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 that, that so in there is the new frontier and that's another two to three years work is to integrate rosters quality and safety and this stuff mm -hmm. so i think so that I'm, I'm content that we've done enough proof of concepts and access to know it's solvable we haven't solved all the problems and there's lots of cool features about the connections of outpatients to theatres the meta logic which we're starting to do some work on as well which is really cool um, but that, all of that is just one piece. The second piece is the quality and safety stuff, including untoward incidents and outcome stuff. And then the third piece is rosters. And I think that, that's, where the, that's where the automated hospital of the future has to get to, you know, in terms of uh, answering its question once and for all. So, yeah, I absolutely agree. That, for me, it has to be cashed out at team level. So that's a whole new set of R&D. That's a completely new journey. But like you said, there's lots of tools there. So, so we're not starting from scratch. It's about leveraging what's already there and what the clinicians are comfortable with and then abstracting from that into blah, blah, blah. So we start again. <coughs> yeah. Well, if you want to, you know, be involved. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> are there any changes in how the data is collected? No. 
system yeah, we just we just we just introduced our first web forms uh, two weeks ago, so we found we found two limits. One is on the uh, reports of open beds, which turned out to be a very controversial issue, and uh, so we've just got uh, three time we're automating three times a day bed open bed reporting. We can look at the patient flows through beds. That's not controversial, although data quality is interesting in that space. Um, so, so we've got one web form run, running there, which we just didn't have anywhere. My, my goal was to maximise the outcome of the existing data collection. So my rubric was no new data collection. And we, we held on to that for three years, but we just ran out of road. And we just got to know how many open beds we've got. And we've got nothing, you know. And then the second one is very interesting. In our booking office in outpatients, there's a, an 11-tab Excel spreadsheet which is what they actually use for the clinical templates, right? <laughs> it's really interesting. It's one of those complete divorces between reality. Well, how do we do clinic templates? Hibiscus. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's that green screen thing. How do I change a clinic template? Oh yeah, it takes six months and you need the permission of somebody in Brisbane. And so those templates bear no relation whatsoever to what we book. And what we actually book is done on this 11 tab Excel screen. So obviously once we looked at that, we said, oh, that's a web form, isn't it? So now we're just about to automate that and then lock it down so the clinical directors and the office between them are the power users to change the news and reviews, which takes that discretionary idea about a doctor coming in and saying, just give me a quiet clinic next Tuesday, which sort of sometimes happens. And it's like, no, you need clinic director's mission to change the template because we need stabilizing capacity. Is 60% of the gains, you know, because capacity is swinging all over the place. We've got to stabilize it, even for the allocated resources. So, so, so that's the second one we're introducing. That's very exciting because that we did some early stuff, which isn't on here because we didn't have the web form, which is how many slots, even for the templates that we've got up, do we lose because we don't succeed in getting patients booked into them. And in some specialties, it was 15, 20% of our slots were going by. And uh, it was only because we had this frequency that we were able to spot that. So now we're going to be able to monitor on a daily basis, next Tuesday afternoon's clinic, how many slots are still available and how many are booked in. So when the phone calls come in, we target Tuesday afternoon and fill it up. So that's another nice set of information for the clerks there to say, your job today, morning scrum, there's the screen. The job today is to fill up next Tuesday's ENT clinic. And then the whole thing becomes, you know, just much more de-stressed. I think we'll get, I think we'll get some great productivity gains out of that. Is there any extra work, say, for the doctor? <coughs> that green or no, zero. Just, yeah. Zero, yeah. It's the existing data sets. So the actual cost of collection is zero for the stuff compared to uh, usual. So how, how many um, people are working these forms? Say? So you've got 50 hospitals and one or say an out, outpatient, if you, if you build the outpatient form, then how many yeah. people would be you know, in the room doing that? Uh, that's local MIS. So that's not as part of the statewide program. The statewide program is just on standardly available data. So everything I've shown you today doesn't require any new data collection. And all of those applications will be available to all the hospitals in Queensland once we've, fin once we've finished the rollout. We're going past that in our place because we've got a local team as well that leverages some of the stuff that says, oh, what we really need is this. So we're pushing a different set of envelopes to the statewide, which is where the web forms come in. So we've got no plans to go statewide on web forms for precisely that reason, because then we're into, well, how many administrators do we need? And then do we need a strategy? And it's like, oh, no, I don't want to do that. We think we think we can do it within existing resources, but I wouldn't I wouldn't present that to the Department of Health as a strategy because there's too much variation underneath it. So you talked about one system if you were to roll it out over here and say, you know, each hospital has their own yeah. system, yeah. their own vendor. What kind of challenges? Yeah, so so I think that and I don't know if the uh, uh, Canterbury colleagues will have anything to say about this as well. The design of this, which I'm quietly proud of, as you may have gathered, uh, is system agnostic. So it, can, it doesn't depend on the underlying system because it it's, it's operates off the smallest number of data sets that are available everywhere. You can't run any outpatient service if you can't say if it's a morning or an afternoon. You don't know which doctor it's for and you don't know how, many, how you get a patient into a slot. <coughs> a lot of these are very, very high frequency abstractions for what used to be known as the administrative databases. I think the distinction between administrative and clinical databases is artificial and we need to close it and say, look, this is the business of the team, it's both of those things. And it's no longer administrative, it's information flow. And what, one of the things the 21st century is about is about we're all working information industries now, it's just that some of us don't know it yet. So healthcare is an information business with some human interaction and we haven't got the information bit sorted out, not close. So a direct answer to your question, I think the stuff we've seen today is directly transferable. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't advocate, I'm not, I'm not here to, nor would I actually advocate taking it, because uh, then you'd have to all buy click licenses and that would, <laughs> that would gall me. <laughs> so, uh, 
So I think there's potential for collaborative work, but in terms of what's there now, I don't really want to, you know, I don't really want to release that to the wild because then everyone's going to have to have a click license. And I think within three years we'll regret those purchases, you know. So uh, that would be my thought anyway, so. How would you add the patient into the mix around all this, you know, rurality, time to get into a clinic, <sighs> that sort of component? That's a fantastic question because two weeks ago I went to... Um, you've got the answer. No. <laughs> no, but I really like the question. Uh, one, one good question is worth 100 wrong answers, and that's a great question. So two weeks ago, I went to Longreach, which some of you might know, is uh, in the Red Centre. It's about 2,000k west of the beach, um, and to an HHS called uh, Central West Queensland HHS. And this, uh, this place has got, is, is publicly responsible for, 20, for healthcare for 22% of the Queensland land mass. Queensland's huge, right, massive, unimaginably big. Um, and it's only got 12,500 people in it. So the distribution, the, the population density is just amazing and weird. And so they've got this really nice setup, really good structure. There's a guy called David Rimmer, he's a medical director, there, he's a great fella. And um, we just kind of connected via the network and he said, you really should come and see us because the world looks very different in a rural look, and it does. But they've got some really nice data systems, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, long story short, they've got, a, they've got one hospital built by the Americans at the end of the, uh, at the beginning of the Second World War. I was telling the story last night. I'll tell it again because it's really interesting. Um, David has taken us around his 31-bedded uh, hospital because they've got to have minimum spec for the hospitals to do uh, emergency births and trauma stabilizations before flying out. So they've got to have this minimum uh, standard. So all the doctors have got to have uh, obstetric and anaesthetic cover 24-7, which is challenging in the uh, rural and remote. So you've got to have 10, 15 doctors to cover the roster and even then. So. Anyway, 31-bedded hospital, basically in the middle of nowhere, um, or in the, in the middle of not very much. It's a very cool place, Longreach, so I'm, not, I'm absolutely not being disrespectful. But he was saying that in the Second World War, they, for the Allies, there was a Brisbane line, and they drew it across the middle of Australia from Brisbane to Perth. And they basically said, if the Japanese invade, we're going to give them the top half. <laughs> and I was kind of, that's a bit weird, isn't it? But that was the decision, that was the military decision. They said, if we invade from the top, we're not even going to defend it until it hits the Brisbane line. So all the way across the middle of Australia, there's a set of healthcare facilities built by the Americans at the start of the Second World War. And there's the Brisbane line, right? Which, oh, fantastic. If it's not true, it's David Rimmer's fault, right? So for posterity, it's David told me that story. I haven't checked it, but I'm sure it's right. Anyway, so 31 minute hospital. Then they've got four hubs where they have a sign of GP, rural generalists that do the hospital stuff as well. And then they've got 10 PHCs, these primary healthcare clinics run by two nurse practitioners and they do first contact work in the distributed populations. And uh, so it's a really cool model and he's done some great work in the last few years, David, getting it staffed up and, and working with the rotations to get the medics out there. Anyway, so they've got these really nice data systems, but they haven't got uh, structured formats on them. And so I was like, oh, this is so cool, because they've got a single instance of medical director for 12,500 people. They've done all the work, so everyone's in the, but they haven't, they haven't, done, they haven't done enough. I think David would uh, acknowledge this. They haven't done enough on really making that a proactive system to manage the diabetes and the respiratory alongside the hospital stuff and the obstetrics and blah, blah, blah. So that was mouth-watering, you know. So I was thinking, oh, we've got some cool techniques. And you've got a really interesting setup for a relatively small population and fantastic databases. You know, really good work's going on. So we're going we're gonna to do some partnership work with them. And so I think in a year's time, I'll be able to come back and go, there you go. You know, so I think that's a great question. And, that, and when I worked in Ireland, it was an interesting issue. Not quite the same extent of rurality, but similar politics. You know, we're in a town, there's 10,000 of us. We've got our local medical facility, the six beds. And you can't close it because, you know, the MP and all that, and rightly so. So how do we optimise the effectiveness of these resources rather than the old idea about cutting them? We don't cut healthcare. We're ageing, we're getting sicker. Well, who's, who's talking about cutting it? You're nuts. The question is how do we afford it and how do we make it productive and how do we make it effective? Anyway. Yeah. Good question. Um, has some of the data and insight that has come out of this kind of uh, information system being able to also influence projections of workforce changes such as are uh, certain roles going to change over time or are different roles needed um, for different functions across hospital and has that influenced discussions around workforce development or workforce planning? Yes and no, so not strategically but yes tactically. So if a team would say we need an extra doctor, we've got a great new conversation about whether or not that's valid. 
and that and that started that is now starting to bear out and and what's interesting now is that the burden of demonstration and the light of this information falls to the clinical director it's not sufficient for you to make aggressive advocacy you've got to explain which cohort you're going to manage and why we can't optimize this to meet the need that you're describing so that, i think that's the right that's the right thing it's it's mature so, so that's been good. What we've not done yet is strategic planning in terms of hospital network or population need. And I think we've got to get the rosters out and really think about the logic of rosters there as well. And it gets very really interesting. I think, though, part of the last, last comment um, is part of the promise of the future is that given a certain set of regulations and a certain set of morbidity and a certain set of safe medical legal practice, there should, in theory, be a costable public health system for every population and its distinct needs. And I think at some point in the 21st century, we should be we should have the ambition of deriving those algorithms. Because the social contract at the moment is Treasury tries to minimise tax and the Department of Health tries to deliver on the basis of insufficient resources. That's the story. And that translates into every clinical team. I've got enough beds, need more doctors, need more nurses. OK. But if we did this and this and this, this is how much it would be. And that's a true account of what we would need to deliver at this level of regulation and threshold to meet the needs of the population. And this would be an appropriate distribution according to rosters and intensity. And I think that I think those things are calculable. I don't think we've remotely got an idea about how to calculate them yet. But this is a down payment link on that as well. A set of jurisdictions, they should each have costable public health systems that then become a part of the natural story of the uh, of the national jurisdiction. But not yet. Okay, um, so just Martin um, is probably the only person I've ever come across who can talk about productivity and efficiency and waiting lists for three hours. <laughs> I make it sound reasonably fun and interesting and I've answered, well, maybe I've taken the wrong career path. <laughs> <laughs> to back into operations, but anyway, I'm not. Um, but just to say a uh, big thank you to Martin for coming over. Um, I do want to acknowledge Bridget Smith who stalked <laughs> Martin from Manchester to Belfast to Stanford to Dublin and then came bouncing over to me one day and said, he's on the Gold Coast! <laughs> <laughs> so we've um, been so great to have Martin come over. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think Bridget and I have seen Martin um, grow from being a, a, a graduate management trainee yeah, into sure. a professor. So, sure. um, uh, so I've been a bit of a privilege. But I think one of the things we will be talking to Martin about um, before he leaves tomorrow is what collaboration would look like um, between between uh, New Zealand or individual institutions in New Zealand that we could maybe potentially broker um, with with Martin and the team over um, in Australia, rather than duplicating and um, we'll be interested in learning and, and spreading. So um, on that note, thank you very much, Professor Conrad. Thank you, Mum. <laughs> <laughs>